Thank you and good evening, councilors. I'd like to welcome everyone to our March 14th, 2023 City Council meeting. In the interest of government transparency with regards to deliberations and decisions made by the City Council and according to open meeting law, since the meeting was posted as a Zoom meeting, this meeting is recorded by video and audio and will be conducted by remote participation. Additionally, all votes taken by the City Council during this and future remote meetings will be by roll call vote. If you're calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you're watching on a computer or device, there's a raised hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either one of these options during oral communications to be recognized to speak. I'd like to open the meeting by reading the non-discrimination statement for city council meetings. It's the finding of the city of Gloucester that no individual should be denied equal treatment or opportunity because of their age, ancestry, color, disability, including intellectual and developmental me mental disability, family status, immigration status, gender identity or expression, military status, marital status, national origin, race, religion, sex, or sexual orientation. I'd like to begin by announcing the councilors. I'm Val Gilman. I'm the Ward 4 City Councilor and Council President. I'd like to introduce Scott Memard, who is the Ward 1 City Councilor, Jason Groh, who is at-large Councilor, Jeff Worthley, who is at-large Councilor, Tony Gross, at-large Councilor, Frank Majota, Ward 3 City Council, Sean Nolan, Ward 5 City Council, as well as Vice Chair of the City Council. Jamie O'Hara, who is going to be calling in until such time as the public hearings, um, and um, he will be um, visible at those um, moments, and mention members of city staff. Uh, Councilor O'Neill is um, going to be five minutes late, but she is coming. I think that's all of the councilors that are here. And then we have John Dunn, who's our CFO. We have Joanne Sinos, who is our city clerk. We have Jill Cahill, Cahill, who is our chief administrative officer. Kenny Coster, who is our auditor. Um, we have Joel Favaza, who is an applicant representing his client tonight. And let me just see if there are any more attendees that I need to mention and recognize. Um, Pam is here. Pam Toby, who is our Director of Communications and Constituents Services. That's it. Um, Bob and Ryan. I believe, and Bob Ryan, who chairs our Traffic Commission. So, and that is all. So um, I'd like to ask Madam Clerk um, to, um, actually, I'd like to begin the meeting with um, a moment of silence for um, Anthony J. Tony Verga, Sr. 87, who passed away peacefully on March 10th, surrounded by his loving family. Tony graduated from St. Anne's High School, class of 1954. Not surprisingly, he was the class president. He served proudly as a veteran of the Korean War in the US Navy. In 1994, he was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives, where he worked tirelessly for military veterans it was his labor of love. He is survived by our mayor, Greg Verger, and his wife, Kelly, in addition to seven other children, 14 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. Tony was a person that was so proud of the city. I just always have fond memories of chatting with him at all the veteran ceremonies, and he was so proud when his son, Greg, became mayor. I'll never forget that moment. Um, Councilors, would anyone else like to say a word or two in memory of um, Tony, um, Tony um, Verger? Um, Scott and then Jeff. Uh, uh, it's, it's a sad day with Tony passing. And like all of you, I'm sure I have my own special memories of Tony. Uh, in my case, uh, we served on the, on the, he was the executive director of the Gloucester Fisheries Commission uh, way back when, 30 God, 35 years ago when I served there. And I remember visiting with him up in his office, which was at the top of the Fitzhenry Lane House with a wonderful view out over Gloucester Harbor. But uh, may he rest in peace. Thank you, Scott. Um, Council Worthley. Yes, thank you. And I'd like to share Council Lemhart's thoughts. May he rest in peace. I'm 45 years old. There's not a lot of people that I can say that I've known well for 30 years aside from immediate family. And Tony would be one of those people. And um, he's been an advisor, a mentor, a friend, 
and uh, it's a big loss to our community. Um, I think everyone knows him in his official roles with the Fisheries Commission and as state representative, but he's been a friend to every part of our community in many, many ways, and uh, it's a big loss. So my heart goes out to his entire family, and um, thank you for letting me have these moments to share my thoughts with him, about him. Thank you. Anyone else like to say a few words? Council Nolan. Um, Tony is a great man and um, did many things for Cape Ann. Uh, all of his actions with the veterans um, stand statewide and universally uh, throughout the, the this country. And I can't thank him for all the work he's done enough. And um, I'm really sorry for the family. Thank you. Um, Council Gross. Yeah, I had the, um, the, I guess the fortune, the good fortune to be able to know Tony before he entered public life when he was the owner of the Schooner Race Lounge. Um, it was a raucous place um, after the main deck got torn down. I believe that was the previous uh, bar that he owned. And a lot of very, very um, wonderful memories uh, were in that place. Uh, and Tony was responsible for several of them. Uh, then he went on to um, greater things that we all know about. Um, I don't often use this, but I truly did love that man. And, uh, and he will be missed. So thank you, Councillor. Thank you. And just to let everyone know that his wake will be on Thursday at Our Lady of Good Voyage from four to seven. And his church service will be at 930 at Our Lady of Good Voyage. And donations are being requested for the Cape Ann Veteran Services. I can't think of a better place that Tony and his family would ask for donations because he certainly loved being a veteran. Um, so let's take a let's take a moment to um, to think warmly of Tony Verga. Thank you, counselors. First order of business, Madam Clerk. First order of business is oral communications. The public shall have the opportunity at every regularly scheduled meeting to be heard under oral communications on matters not appearing on the agenda. Oral communications shall allow any resident who has a request or complaint of any nature relative to city business to appear before the council, state their problem without debate and the matter shall be referred to the proper agency through the office of the mayor. The resident will be notified within a two week period relative to the disposition of same and a copy shall be forwarded to the city council. Persons speaking under oral communications shall be limited to three minutes each. And I believe tonight, Tony, if you wouldn't mind um, being the timekeeper for that because you're the first on the roll call, I'd like to welcome Tracy O'Neill our Ward 2 City Councilor. And also, um, I'd like to um, give uh, Councilor Tony Gross an opportunity to speak before we begin the oral communication. So Tony, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Councilor. Um, I inadvertently and um, did not include residents in the, um, in the oral communications or the public hearing, and that was not an oversight that was just an absolute um, omission on my part, something that I firmly believe that uh, that that the residents deserve to have their voice and um, and I'm sorry that it caused such an uproar, but one of the reasons we have this process is that it gets referred out or this is just a draft, a proposed draft and there's usually some debate over these things and that's how this, uh, process works. That's that's how it works. And so, um, but I'm I'm sorry if it caused anybody any consternation because it was uh, completely unintended, and uh, I was horrified when I thought about it later. And in fact, um, when I mentioned it to uh, one of the other counselors, uh, Councillor Gilman, we're not on the same subcommittee, so it wasn't a deliberation. 
um, or a quorum issue that I had told her on Friday that I had put that in and she mentioned to me, she said, oh, what about the renters? You need to have residents. And I was like, oh, yes, right. All right, we'll fix that on Tuesday. Well, I uh, didn't get a chance to fix it on Tuesday, but uh, anyway, it's always better to, to clear things up earlier rather than later. So hope everybody's okay with that and understand that we are, you know, this is just a discussion and that's how, that's how it works. Nothing's, nothing's been written in stone. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate that. Um, so attendees, we have 21. Would anyone um, go ahead, uh, Councilor Gross? Um, one of my kids has a little bit of an emergency that I got to make a call to. So I'm gonna have to step off for a second. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see. Councilor Grow, would you mind timing the um, the three minutes for the public uh, comments? And um, at 10 minutes before the three minutes, just raise your hand so we can remind people. So would anyone like to speak in public comments for matters that are not on the agenda? Raise your hands if you would. Mm. Joanne, I don't see anybody, do you? I do not. No one has raised okay. their hand. Okay, um, there are no hands raised for public comment. So um, next order of business, Madam Clerk. Next order of business is the confirmation of new appointments. Okay, and I'll um, give the floor to Sean Nolan who chairs ordinances and administration. So you have the floor, Sean, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, so first we have for the Board of Registrars, we have Mark Nestor, who will be fulfilling an unexpired term, term to expire 2-14-24. On the ONA report, um, the committee recommends on a motion by Councilor Gross, seconded by Councilor Worthley, that the Ordinance Administration Committee voted three in favor, zero opposed to recommend the City Council appoint Mark Nestor for filling an unexpired term to the Board of Registrars, term to end 214-24, and I so move. Second. 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 Um, motion made by Councilor Nolan, seconded by Councilor Gilman. Is there discussion, Councilors? Seeing none, roll call vote. Councilor Groh. Uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. Council Majota? Yes. Council Memard? Yes. Council Nolan? Yes. Council O'Hara? Yes. Council O'Neill? Council Worthley? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Council Gilman? And although Tony is on the call, um, I, he can't vote because he is now absent for this particular vote, but I would note that he made the motion for Mark Nestor in ONA as an alternate. Um, so it is eight in favor, one absent. Next order of business, um, Council Nolan. We have the Community Preservation Committee with Jane Remsen, um, term effective 215-23, term to end 214-26. Um, on a motion by Council Worthley, seconded by Councilor Gross, the Ordinance and Administration Committee voted three in favor, zero opposed, to recommend the City Council appoint Jane Remsen, term effective 215-23 to the Community Preservation Act, term to end 214-26, and I so move. Second. Motion made by Council Nolan, seconded by Council Worthley. Is there a discussion? Uh, Council Grow. I, I would only just point out that, that Jane, I believe, is fulfilling the role of the planning board member on the uh, Community Preservation Commission. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Any further discussion, councilors? Seeing none, roll call vote. Councilor Gross? Yes. Council Grow? Yes. Council Majota? Yes. Council Memard? Yes. Thank you. Council Nolan? Yes. Council O'Hara? Yes. Council O'Neill? Council Worthley? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. The yes is 
passed. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. The next order of business is the consent agenda. <clears throat> um, counselors, would anyone yes. like to remove yes. any matter that's on the consent agenda? Council Nolan. I would like to remove under reappointments uh, Al Catone from the Fisheries Commission. Fisheries. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Council O'Neill. Yes, I would like to remove uh, Council Order 2023-021 and 2023-002. 002? Um, 022, sorry. Okay, so 21 and 22, okay. Anyone else want to remove something from the consent agenda? Okay, um, is there a motion to approve the matters on the consent agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Motion made by Council Worthy, seconded by Councilor Memard. Um, roll call vote, Council Gross. Yes. Council Grow. Yes. Council Majota. Yes. Council Memard. Yes. Council Nolan. Yes. Council O'Hara. Yes. Council O'Neill. Yes. Council Worthy. Yes. Council Gilman, yes. The yeses have it, nine in favor, zero opposed. Now back to the matters that have been removed. The first, um, I will ask um, Council Nolan to explain why you have removed Al Catone um, from the Fisheries Commission. Um, as it turns out, Al is working in a situation where he's not eligible to be on the board at this time and the mayor's office has asked that we remove, we remove him from the list. Okay, so um, would you like to withdraw um, him from the consent agenda without objection? Yes, I would. Okay. Councils without objection. No objection. Okay, seeing none. Um, Council O'Neill, you have the floor on the two orders that you've asked to remove. One is um, Council uh, City Council 2023-021, Gilman, amend the City Council Rules of Procedures 2022 by amending Rule 2, Order Business, Rule 3, <laughs> Agenda Procedure, Rule 4, Public Hearings, Rule 6, Rules of Debate, Rule 8, Committees, and Rule 12, Special Permits, and that was to be referred to ONA and actually governance as well. Um, that was on the... Um, so we, we should clarify that um, when we um, we accept that. And um, and then also the um, number three, which is City Council 2023-022, gross, amend the City Council Rules of Procedure 2022 by amending Rule 1 meetings, Rule 3, agenda procedure, Rule 4, public hearings, Rule 8, committees, Rule 9, vacancy in a council position and filing same or um, filling same rule 10 procedure for selecting an interim mayor so um and that would also be referred to both governance and ona um so council o'neill you have the floor um council no one had a stand up so i don't know if you wanted to say something before i started council nolan i didn't know if you wanted to separate the two and vote on one and discussion on the other um, Council O'Neill, is this is this a can you can you discuss this both together, or would you prefer to do each one separately? Um, I I really don't know that it matters. So okay, so so we can do it together. Go ahead. You have the floor to explain um, why you're removing these. Okay. Um, uh, number zero twenty one. Um, Rule number two, uh, I suggest that, that um, this should be at the discretion of the council president, whomever that may be. So the non-discrimination statement opener for city council meetings 
I don't think it should be the letter of the law. I think it should be at the discretion of the council president. So Councillor O'Neill, just, just a, um, kind of a formality here in terms of um, these matters. So right now we're not debating these, we're not discussing them. We are just referring them to the appropriate committees. And we've agreed that we want to put one to start off in governance and review these and then they would go to ONA. So the purpose of this referral is just to do that. We're simply referring it to those other two locations. Does that make sense? Yeah, but what is the point of being able to take something off the consent agenda if it's not to discuss it? It's because we're just, it's just the purpose of referring it. It's if, if something, um, if something needed to be corrected or, um, but, but we're not looking to deliberate on these. We are just referring them. Matters have to come up twice for the city council. So this is the first time. This is just our rubber stamp to send it back to subcommittee. Okay. Um, and so, in this okay. case, both governance and ONA, because we think that this is, this is, these are our rules of procedure. Every once in a while, we should look at them. This was an opportunity. Council Worthley actually wanted to um, to, to amend one just to change the hours of our stopping time, which is very simple. And that will also be referred to governance and ONA. Um, and, um, and then we all just took an opportunity based on Joanne's request to look at what we thought needed to be amended or added. And it's really, it's all subject to our agreement when we get into governance and talk it through. Um, so that's the process. Does that help you? Kind of. However, one of these rules of procedure that has been changed states, if I can find it, hold on, that a city councilor who is not a member of the subcommittee has to submit questions to the subcommittee chair or the who is ever, or the substitute chair and the city clerk and the clerk of committees before the meeting. And so that would mean that I can't ask questions at ONA. So that is a recommendation because ONA, because if we have a quorum of a of a um, of the full committee, we can't be in jeopardy of deliberating. And so what we try to do is we 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 try to keep it to questions. And it's it's a it's a lengthy conversation that requires more more dialogue. And I think it would be great that we can discuss this. This was just a suggestion, and, and I'll look forward to discussing that in um, in governance and then ONA. So we we have not made it's just it it's a suggestion. That's why we all did these little amendments, and and they everyone will have an opportunity to take a look at all of these and add to it if they feel like we might have missed some amendments. So correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't there a, a time when um, a counselor wanted to ask a question at ONA and he was refused and then he went to Point ask of a order, Madam counsel? Chair. Um, Councilor Nolan, um, state your point of order. My point of order is we've moved beyond uh, consent of gender into deliberation. Um, this is for further topic. It's uh, consent agenda, we're removing things, we can say why, but we're not here to ask questions or deliberate on motions in front of us that we have coming up at Governance ONA. Okay, I, 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 su I support Councilor Nolan. Um, Councilor O'Neill, can we put these back on the consent agenda for a referral? I don't, I'm, I don't understand why something can be taken off and I'm, I apologize if I don't understand this. Why do you ask, does somebody want to take this off the consent agenda for discussion? Those are your words. Um, be, because what we're trying to do is it's, it's a parliamentary procedure rule and we are just seeing if someone, maybe some something in the, in the body of that comment needed a, a, a change word, but it's not discussing the specifics of those initiatives. That is all done in subcommittee. 
um, and we look forward to that conversation and having a governance meeting. Um, I really don't want to get into a long conversation about this, but um, I'll pick on Council Worthley and grow, and then we will vote this. Um, Council Worthley, you have the floor. I'll, I'll be very brief here. I think Councillor O'Neill is raising good questions, and it's fair to ask, but the last time I was in the council 20 years ago, we would vote on every single one of the referrals separately, sometimes by vote roll call. It would take an hour just to send things to the committees that we're working on. The point of the consent agenda is to say, are we sending to the right committee? Is there some other reason not to send it to that committee? And that's what the vote is right now. Uh, we wouldn't send, for example, rules of procedure to budget and finance, right? Okay. So the ordinance administration committee is the right place to refer to. And that's why we would take something off if there was an error like that. I hope that helps. So okay, that, that's a good point, Council Worthley. Uh, Council Grow, do you have anything yeah, to add? You're, you're, you're dead right, Jeff. I and mean, there's there's situations where something might be referred to P&D that is also relevant at BNF, and that's the time to make that change. Also, as you saw tonight, there was a there was a, 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 a reappointment that is no longer valid. That was taken off so that we could correct that and take it out of, out of the situation. And in your mm -hmm. case, in this particular case, we should be making a, mo a motion to refer to governance as well. And that's that's the uh, that's really the only thing that we should be talking about at this point. I do have um, one more question. Okay, Council O'Neill, you have the floor. Who is on the government governance committee? Oh. Everybody. The governance is just the name of a workshop that is for all of us to attend. Okay. okay. And Suzanne will join us. So um, so I just like to um to be clear that right now we are referring, actually we're also referring Council Wordly, um, which is 2023-020 um, to, um, to O&A and governance. So it really is, even though we've already voted on that, just to be clear, those three motions, um, those three initiatives should be referred to both O&A and governance. And we'll make sure we pick a, a good date for everybody. And uh, Suzanne will be there with us and we'll all review the rules of procedure. And we can have a rigorous conversation about all of these changes that we're all individually recommending. And I'm sure that there will be additional matters that all of the rest of you might want to add into. It will be a collaborative governance meeting. And I look forward to that. So um, without um, lingering on here with this conversation, Councilor New, you have the floor. And will the governance meeting be a public meeting as well? Of course, governance okay. meetings and workshops are all public meetings. All right, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. All right, so is everybody clear? We're recommending that um, 2023 020 Worsley, 2023 021 Gilman, 2023 022 Gross be referred to both governance and ONA and I so move. Second. Motion made by Gilman. Seconded by Council Memart. Council Nolan. And also to remove Al Catone from the reappointments. I think, didn't we already vote on that? No. We didn't vote on removing Al? Joanne? Oh, there was, no, I don't believe so. You didn't do a roll call. Well, we I did. thought we did a motion to withdraw without objection. We did a motion to withdraw without objection. Yeah, we did okay. do that. All right, so you don't need a roll call vote for that. I don't believe we need a roll call vote for that. No. Um, so I, right. think, I think we're good. So, so the motion's been made on the other three and it was seconded. Um, roll call vote, Councilor Gross? Yes. Councilor Grow? Yes. Councilor Majota? Yes. Council Memard? Yes. Council Nolan? Yes. Council O'Hara? Yes. Council O'Neill? Yes. Council Worthley? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. That motion passes nine in favor, zero opposed. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. Next order of business is the Budget and Finance Standing Committee Report of March 9th. And I'd like to turn the meeting over to um, Council Memard, who chairs BNF. So you have the floor, Councillor. Thank you very much. Uh, we have three or four items. I apologize in advance because uh, two of them are a little uh, lengthy in the in the language, but uh, they serve a purpose, of course. 
Uh, the first is a memorandum from our assistant DPW director, Mark Cole, requesting our acceptance of a departmental, Department of Environmental Protection Recycling Dividends Grant in the amount of $24,000 for the calendar year 2020, and I so move. Second. Motion made by Council Member, seconded by Council Worthley. By way is of background, is there a discussion or Councilor Memar? Do you have the floor on the narrative? As as uh, Mr. Cole explained to the Budget and Finance Committee, uh, as you see from the the date here, this dates back to 2020, and it was uh, received during the prior administration, uh, but it was not properly accounted for. The money uh, it was has been received, and this is uh, we actually accepted a similar similar program grant. Uh, several weeks ago for the current period. This is a from a prior year period. And we're, this motion is to uh, accept that so that it can be put to good use. Thank you. Uh, further discussion, councilors on the motion. Seeing none, roll call vote. Councilor Gross? Yes. Councilor Groh? Yes. Councilor Majota? Yes. Councilor Memard? Yes. Councilor Nolan? Yes. Council O'Hara? Council O'Hara? Yes. Thank you. Council O'Neill? Yes. Council Worthley? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. Yes is passed. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Next order of business, Council Memard. Our second budget and finance item is a memorandum from the fire chief regarding an application for FEMA assistance to firefighters grant AFG for the 20 for the fiscal year 2022 program. Uh, this is actually uh, a request to the council to to, uh, to approve their application for this uh, funding. They have not yet made the application or received it, but this is our, our approval to proceed to, to uh, file an application for it. And that relates to uh, rules that were adopted by the council a number of years back uh, relating to grants that are in this in this range. And th this one is an up to, up to $2 million grant. So the purpose is to, uh, uh, to approve the fire department's application to purchase fire aerial apparatus unit for the Gloucester Fire Department. Um, it it's a grant in the amount of uh, potentially $2 million, $2 million and a local grant would be required of 10%. Um, so okay. Any other you questions? Make the, motion, that would be great. The, the fire chief offered to attend. I said we were all set based on the presentation that his lieutenant made at this budget and finance committee. Okay, so the motion. Uh, budget and finance voted unanimously to recommend that the city council approve under GCO section 16.1 to permit the Gloucester Fire Department to permit the Gloucester Fire Department to apply for a FEMA assistance to firefighters grant in the amount of $2 million with a local match required of 10% that equates to $200,000 for a total of $2,200,000. The purpose of the grant is to purchase a, aerial, a fire aerial apparatus unit for the Gloucester Fire Department and I so move. Second. Motion made by Council Member, second by Council Worthy. Um, is there more of a narrative council member on your motion? Uh, not unless anybody else from budget and finance would like to add to that. Okay. Um, discussion councilors, uh, council gross. Be an well, just want This kind of seems kind of odd, um, particularly to the new councilors of why are we talking about something that we haven't even been awarded yet. Um, a few years ago, the city council determined that anything over a hundred thousand dollars that re requires a matching um, funds, city funds, has to come before the city council before they apply for it. There's a provision also in the, the language to allow them to apply for it if it's timely and then come and ask for us, ask later. But this is, that's what this is about, is it's anything over $100,000 that requires a, a match from the city's, city's coffers um, has to come to us for approval to apply. Great, thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion, Councillor Grow? Uh, was there any discussion as to where this funding is going to be coming from, or they have they identified that at this point? Is it premature? We did um, not discuss that any further. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion, Councillors? 
Seeing none, roll call vote. Council Gross? Yes. Council Grow? Yes. Council Majota? Yes. Council Memard? Yes. Council Nolan? Yes. Council O'Hara? Yes. Council O'Neill? Yes. Council Worthley? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. Yes, let's have it. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Next order of business. <clears throat> Um, uh, the next two items, uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you. The next two items both uh, are basically uh, housekeeping uh, within the, the treasurer's office. Our chief financial officer is requesting transfer of funds and a consolidation of various remaining balances. It's basically mm -hmm. what you might call a, a, a sweep in a financial institution where we're taking small remainders from a number of different accounts that, are no, that had balances left over in them uh, and going ahead and putting that into a, 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 a consolidating them into a new account that can be accessed and identified. Um, and the first one, I'll, I'll go ahead and read the motion and then there's, there's discussion, but okay. uh, on a motion by myself, seconded by Councilor Worsley, Budget and Finance Committee voted three in favor, zero opposed to recommend the City Council approve the following appropriations as follows. Order that in accordance with chapter 44, section 20 of the general laws, the $10,242.80 unexpended balance of fund 6413 initially borrowed to pay for the costs of CIP various sewer systems, the $14,811.69 unexpended balance fund 6414 initially borrowed to pay the costs of CIP 17 sewer improvement, Gloucester Avenue and Breezy Point, as well as the $5,565.04 unexpended balance of fund 6415 initially borrowed for the purpose of paying the costs of CIP 2017 wastewater clarifiers, the $3,134.39 unexpended balance in fund 6417 initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP 18 miscellaneous sewer mains and pumps, the $10,923.31 unexpended balance in fund 6418 initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP sewer pumping station Beacon Marine, the seven, six hundred, excuse me, the $761.70 cent unexpended balance of fund 6419 initially borrowed to pay costs of CIP school 19 schoolhouse sewer improvements, all of which projects are complete and such amounts are no longer needed for the projects and are hereby appropriated by this council to cover the $7,100.94 deficit in fund 6420 CIP sewer improvements WF, WPCF hydrochlorite with a balance of $38,000 $338,337.99 to be borrowed, to be transferred to fund 6417 miscellaneous sewer projects. And I so move. Second. Motions made by Council Memard, second by Council Worthley. Is there more of a narrative, Council Memard? Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 this reflects a lot of projects in the uh, mm -hmm. DPW Department, capital improvement projects across the city over a time period some five, six, seven years ago. And again, this is just a sweep of these remaining balances to clean up the accounts, that the, the funds that are sitting in these spe spe specific identified accounts and put those funds back into uh, one new account or to otherwise access them for ongoing projects. Great, thank you. Further discussion, counselors? Seeing none, roll call vote, Councilor Gross. Yes. Councilor Grow. Yes. Councilor Majota. Yes. Councilor Memard. Yes. Councilor Nolan. Yes. Councilor O'Hara. Yes. Councilor O'Neill. Yes. Councilor Worthley. Yes. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Yes is have it. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Um, next order of business, Councilor No. Um, Councilor Memard. Yes. Thank you. Madam President, uh, this is number four and our, our last item from budget finance. It's a memorandum from the RCFO John Dunn regarding transfer of capital projects funds into the city's general fund. And the one before that I read you was the short one. 
This is the more lengthy one. And on a motion by myself, seconded by Councillor Gross, Budget and Finance Committee voted three in favor, zero opposed, to recommend the City Council approve the following appropriations. Ordered that in accordance with section 44, paragraph 20 of the general laws, chapter 44, paragraph 20 of the general laws, the $18,207.42 unexpended balance of fund 5028, initially borrowed to pay the costs of the CIP capital items, CIP 13 capital items, the one cent unexpended balance in fund 5040 initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP 16 fire command vehicle, the $1,734.19 unexpended balance of fund 5043 initially borrowed to pay the cost of the CIP Stark Knot Heights sediment paving project, the $34,070.23 unexpended balance of fund 5044 initially borrowed to pay the costs of the CIP 17 building improvements and departmental vehicles, the $17,810.23 unexpended balance and fund 5047 initially borrowed to pay the cost of the CIP 17 Haskell Dam project, the $1,200 unexpended balance of fund 5048, initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP 17 Park Lane Paving, the $1,892.16 unexpended balance of fund 5049, initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP 18 Brooks Road Paving, the $14,093.40 unexpended balance of fund 5050, initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP 18, the East Gloucester elementary school feasibility study, the $13,180.02 unexpended balance and fund 5051, initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP 18 Lanes Cove breakwater project, $12,615.82 unexpended balance of fund 5056, initially borrowed to pay the cost of the CIP 19 Nashua road paving project, the $4,791.34 unexpended balance and fund 5058, initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP Southern Road paving, the $24,728.04 unexpended balance of fund 5064, initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP 20 Englewood Road paving, the $777.50 unexpended balance of fund 5065, initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP Seville Road paving, the $615 unexpended balance of fund 5066 initially borrowed to pay the cost of CIP 20 DPW vehicles and, and equipment. The $28.50 unexpended balance of fund 5069 initially borrowed to pay the cost of Briar Neck paving, all of which projects are complete and such amounts totaling $145,743.86 are no longer needed for those projects and are therefore and hereby appropriated by this council to be transferred to fund 5070 miscellaneous capital projects to pay the cost of any legal project expenditure as defined by the Massachusetts General Law 44, section seven or eight, including the pay payment on any and all costs incidental and related thereto. And I so move. Sorry, Ken. Ken Kenny, did I get that all right? <laughs> Mot motions made by Council Member. It was seconded by Council Gross. Um, is there more of a narrator, narrative, Council Member? Well, as we commented at Budget and Finance Committee, it's, it's an interesting survey of, of projects that the city has undertaken, both uh, in the DPW and in, in the city in terms of uh, capital improvements. A lot of these were, in the se second batch, are, are betterment paving projects that were, have been undertaken by various neighbors, neighborhoods to uh, repave and address pothole issues on private roads as well as other projects. But it, it gives you a good flavor of a lot of the work of the council over the last few years. And uh, these again are just small remainder balances that we're, we're doing some housekeeping to clean up, sweep the uh, balances out and put them into an account where they can be utilized going forward. Thank you, Council Member, uh, Council Gross. Yeah, in particular on the um, the road uh, betterments um, that have been successfully completed, um, it needs to be said that the this money it 
was part of the borrowing, but the residents on the roads were not, this is not part of that, but they were billed the cost. This is the remainder after, you know, what they borrowed because the treasurer had to bundle things together. There's certain tax ramifications or benefits rather that you have by bundling these things together and they have to give it a number and they give it a number. And sometimes that's over by one cent. Sometimes it's over by, you know, 13, $14,000, um, but better than being under so you can get the project completed. And so, but de definitely on any of those betterments, the, um, this is not money that should go back to the, to the residents, to the abutters of those roads. This is, they were billed for what the cost was. And this is over and above that. This is, this is the, um, the, the, I guess the change uh, left over, you know, if it was 19, dollars and 50 cents and you've got a 20 you know this is the 50 cents left over thank you council gross any further discussion council Worley? i'd like to add to that and i thank you council gross for reminding me and council memhard uh, at the committee level i'd ask that question is this taxpayer money that should be sent back to taxpayers and just to be clear to anybody who's listening that this is not an overage of charging more it's an overage of our estimate of the cost in when we went to borrow. So I think it's actually really smart planning to, to sweep these accounts. If you notice is one of them is one cent in it, but um, our auditor and our treasurer, they don't miss anything. So uh, this is definitely a much better process to clean up these accounts. And this isn't money that should be going back to taxpayers because they weren't charged this at these overages. Thank you for sharing that Councilor Gross. Thank you, Council. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Councilor Gross? Yes. Councilor Gros? Yes. Councilor Majota? Yes. Councilor Memard? Yes. Councilor Nolan? Yes. Councilor O'Hara? Yes. Councilor O'Neill? Yes. Councilor Worthley? Yes. Councilor Gilman? Yes. The yes is have it. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Council uh, Memard. Um, next order of business, Madam Clerk. The next order of business is the Ordinance and, and Administration Standing Committee Report of March 6th. Council Nolan. There's no matters for discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> sort of business, Madam Clerk. The, plan, the Planning and Development Standing Committee Report of March 8th. <clears throat> can we have Council someone come in with a Heimlich maneuver in case Sean G? <laughs> <laughs> um, Wait, just, let, me, let me just defend Council Nolan. He no, gets no, out of work no at about 5 30 no and, and somehow manages to make this all happen. No, it's, so it's awesome. It's great that he's, he's, he's there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, just a quick uh, recap of uh, the March 8th meeting. Uh, a couple things were continued. Uh, discussion on the transfer station and also the Bisky Head uh, here will be continued. Uh, we did have a, uh, an informal review about the prospect of having outdoor dining in Main Street. And the general consensus was that there was uh, not the desire or the urge or the, the, the pounding at the door to get anything motivated on the part of the businesses or anybody to do new um, additional uh, uh, block parties. So it's been abandoned at this point. Um, if it comes up in the future, that's a different issue. But for now, uh, there will be no outdoor dining on anything other than uh, the um, uh, block parties. Um, so that's that. And then uh, number four, we had a, a rather robust uh, discussion and presentation on the MBT MBTA 3A uh, community zoning and uh, the um, the comprehensive planning initiative that's being initiated by the mayor and the administration. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't well attended, um, which is too bad, but I would really, really encourage everyone to go back and watch this uh, subcommittee meeting, listen to the presentations that were given by Suzanne Egan and David Fields, our community development director, uh, listen to the discussion that was had by the, the three of us on the on P and D, um, and also the the presentations are all in the uh, the meeting notes from that um, uh, P and D agenda or that P and D meeting. Uh, there's a lot of good information in there. Uh, I think that every counselor should definitely watch this. I think 
every member of the public should but definitely watch this. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a two-year process between the um, MBTA communities discussion and the comprehensive planning initiative. Um, they're, they're two separate things that have a commonality to them. Uh, so there, there will be times when one is being talked about and it, more than the other, but um, uh, it is going to be a topic of conversation for the next two years. So best to educate thyself. And that's it. Thank you, Councilor Grow. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. This is the first public hearing, public hearing 2023-006 to amend the Gloucester Code of Ordinances, Chapter 2, Administration, Article 4, Departments, by adding a new Division 5 entitled Department of Elder Services. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Would anyone like to uh, speak in favor? Um, I, I believe... Um, our CAO, Jill Cahill. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, through you to the council. I just wanted to uh, speak on the mayor's behalf tonight. He can't be here, obviously. He's got some stuff going on. Um, we, I, the administration supports uh, this this order and um, we understand it going forward. And if that's the will of the council, we're, we welcome that. Uh, we do want to uh, express our concern about changing the rules of the game in the middle for the current employee. Uh, this employee, uh, from a management perspective, which is is a lot of what we do in personnel perspective, um, the current employee was brought on on under certain terms, and um, we would be reluctant to change the terms of the game in the middle of the game. So, while we support you guys moving forward, we hope that you will understand um, and put this out. Uh, they've the appointment piece of this out to the to a future date to affect a future employee. Um, beyond that, we we welcome it. We um, the current employee also just so people know she's more than happy to always speak to any counselors and um, about the work that she does and and the vision for the senior center. Um, so we look forward to working with you guys on this. And if you have any questions for the administration, um, here to answer them. Great, thank you. Anyone else like to speak in favor? Um, we have, um, Frank Bellini, um, Joanne, Frank, um, if, we, if you would introduce yourself and your address and you have three minutes to speak to us. Um, sure. and I, um, I asked that council gross, if you no, actually okay. Joanne, I think I, 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 I'm, I'm going to ask Joanne to, um, keep track of, of the public comments here so we can pay close attention. So. Thank you, Joanne. Um, three minutes, that would be great. Um, so Thank Frank, you. you have the floor, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, I'll be brief uh, and I'll submit in writing if you wish uh, my notes. Um, okay. I retired Frank, here to Gloucester. You, I'm sorry. Can you share your with us your address? Oh, I'm sorry, 15 Hammond Street. Thank you. Two thirds of the way up the hill, a very nice view of the harbor. Uh, I retired here about seven years ago with my wife, uh, Cindy, and uh, we enjoy Gloucester a great deal. Uh, I have volunteered, as has my wife now, under two um, directors of elder services and you know, doing a variety of different tasks, both at Rose Baker Center and uh, with both of us as a member of the board of directors of the Friends of the Gloucester Council on Aging. Um, it is our considered opinion that the holder of this management position uh, needs to be on par with the rest of the managers uh, within the city organization. Uh, the number of seniors and their proportion in the general city population will only grow uh, in coming years and it becomes a highly relevant position to support this important population group. So I would ask for your serious consideration, uh, notwithstanding changing horses in the middle of the stream, uh, but uh, I would suggest to you that uh, all of these um, positions need to be on par with each other and uh, no other considerations uh, with regard to hiring 
uh, for management positions within the city should be considered. And that is it. Thank you, Frank. Anyone You're else welcome. like to speak in favor? Um, we have um, Howard Fritz. How are you, Howard? Would you um, introduce yourself and your um, address? Welcome. Howard, you are muted. Now you're, now you are, now you're muted. Can you un unmute yourself? Okay, you're unmuted. We can't hear you. Um, can you hit pound nine if you're calling in on a phone? Madam Clerk, do you have any other suggestions for Howard? How about now? Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Welcome and state your <coughs> um, address too. Thank you. All right, thank you. My name is Howard Frisch. I own a business located at 128 Main Street in Gloucester. Um, I have had the uh, honor of being the president of the Friends of the Gloucester Council on Aging for over 20 years. Uh, at a recent meeting, uh, we voted in favor of supporting this idea, this uh, elevation of the director of elder, serv of elder services uh, to the management position in the, in the city. Uh, the seniors represent almost one in four of every uh, citizen in our community. And I think this position deserves the recognition um, that we've been waiting for for years. So again, on behalf of the Friends of the Gloucester Council on Aging, we are in support of this uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you for all you do on the Friends. Um, I, I wanted to question um, Council Nolan and Council O'Hara. Are you both present right now? So you're listening to this because it would be great if, um, thank you. Excellent. Cool. We want you to be able to participate in the public hearing. So thank you. Um, is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor? Bob Ryan, we know who you are, but could you introduce yourself for the record and your street? Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam President, other councilors, City Clerk uh, Joanne Sinos. My name is Bob Ryan, 3 Blake Court here in Gloucester. I'm here this evening to support the Council Order 2023-01, amend the Gloucester Code of Ordinance, Chapter 2, Administration, Article 4, Departments by adding Division 5, Director of Elder Services. Only recently did I learn after serving the city of Gloucester for over 45 years as a volunteer that this position is one of only a few department directors in the city of Gloucester not needing city council approval. I strongly believe that the director of elder services overseeing a population of over 12,000 seniors, the position should have approval from the full nine member city council. For parity of all city management positions, and in line with other department heads, board members, commission members, committee members, I strongly feel that the director of elder services require approval and reappointment by the city council. The mayor can continue to uh, appoint only with the approval of the city council who represents all of the people. A unilateral appointment of the director of elder services and I feel most will agree is not the most transparent or democratic way of selecting a city department director. The director should be accountable to all the people of Gloucester and have a city council review every three years, just as we have seen here this evening with numerous appointments and reappointments by you. Lastly, since the position has been filled by the same individual since July of 2020, and that there is no contract in place, perhaps the appointment to the position and a performance review take place commencing July 1, 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Any, anyone else like to speak in favor? Anyone like to speak in opposition? Seeing none. Um, are there any questions, counselors, that we have for our CAO, Jill Cahill? 
Um, Joanne, go ahead. There are no communications. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Jill, I, I jumped ahead to you um, sooner than I should have. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jill Cahill on this matter? Um, Council O'Hara. Thank you. I just want to confirm there is there is no contract in place with the present director. Uh, correct. Our managers uh, correct. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, counselors? Jill, would you just clarify this for me? It this this particular matter is specifically creating the Department of Elder Services in the Gloucester Code of Ordinance because currently it is not there. Is that correct? Um, I don't, I guess I'd have to look at the language more closely. My, my understanding is that what's up for discussion today is um, cause it's the council on aging. The position is the director of the council on aging. Um, okay. And that it's the, what's up for discussion is whether or not that becomes an appointed position. And um, I think uh, I want to thank Howard. I think he did a really great job of, ex of explaining the importance of elevating that position to that mm -hmm. of the other department heads, the other, um, the, the other department heads are all appointed. Um, and uh, just so we're clear, one of the uh, priorities for this administration was to do to do performance reviews on all of our department heads. And we embarked on that um, this past fall and have worked our way through just about all of them, um, particularly starting with the ones that were up for reappointment this year. So um, it's a piece, it's a very important piece of the administration and the mayor's goals. So we are working on that. So um, to uh, Bob Ryan's point, we will, there's already been, we've already been working on performance reviews. So we can easily meet that goal of, of July 1, 2023. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, counselors? Seeing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing and ask for the committee report from Councilor Nolan. Thank you, Madam President. Um, on a motion by Council Majota, seconded by Council O'Hara, the Ordinance Administration Committee voted by roll call, three in favor, zero opposed, to recommend that the City Council amend GCO Chapter 2, Administration, Article 4, Departments by Adden. Division 5, Department of Elder Services, Section 2-294, established. There is hereby established in the city a Department of Elder Services. Section 2-295, Director of Elder Services. Position confirmed, appointed, appointment term. The Department of Elder Service shall be managed by the Director of Elder Services under the supervision of the mayor. The director shall be appointed by the mayor for a term of two years, subject to the approval of the city council in, obviously blank, years only. Section 2-296, duties. The director of all the services shall develop and deliver programs to meet the needs of the total senior population of the city of Gloucester. The director shall work with the council and agent supervise the program operations and activities of the senior center and perform such other duties as may be appropriate. Section 2-297 and 2-399 is reserved in this matter. And I move. Second. Um, the motion was made by Councilor Nolan. It was seconded by Councilor Worthley. Um, is there a um, narrative, Councilor Nolan? Madam, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to amend the uh, motion. Um, so we have not, we have not voted on the main motion yet, Councilor Grow. I know, we amend them before we vote on the main motion. Okay. Yep. Um, so thank you. 
So, um, so the amendment? floor is yours, Council Crow. Move that we amend the main motion to indicate that the council approval will go into effect upon the appointment of the next new director of elder services, at which point the position will be subject to council approval and subject to reappointment and approval every two years thereafter. And I submit Second. Second. Motion made by Councilor Grow on amendment. It was seconded by Councilor Nolan. Is there a discussion on the amendment to the main motion, Councilors? Um, Council Grow. Um, I, I just very briefly. I, I agree very much so that this position should be uh, subject to council approval. But I also agree and in, in hear the argument from uh, CAO Cahill that to change the uh, the rules of the road in the middle for the existing director um, is unfair and a change of her working environment that I think is you know she's now subject to working at the at the behest of the mayor. If the mayor chooses to continue on with her, he can do that. If he chooses through the uh, review process to not continue to have her working, that is up to him. But once we have a new director under the under the new set of rules, then that would be subject to council approval and reappointment. And that's my that's my position. Um, any um, discussion on the amendment to the main motion? Um, I will go with Council Nolan because his hand was raised first and then Council O'Hara. Um, I think this goes back to like the old days. I mean, you think about Thanksgiving and Christmas with Charlie Brown, um, football. I, I don't like adding rules to something in the middle of someone that's being, you know, put in a position. So to me, this is pulling the football out when someone's when Charlie Brown's trying to kick it. Um, we have a person that is performing a job um, that works as a city time em, uh, employee. It's now going to be appointed, so it's already going to be a, you know, brought to an attention that our next hire would be a two-year appointment versus a job. Um, so there's a lot at stake at this, but I, I just don't feel at this point that we should be making rules that employees that work someone's employment that hasn't done anything detrimental to their job. And we should leave it as the same until the next time comes up for the next hire, next appointee. Thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Hara on the amendment to the main motion. Thank you. I, I think I clearly, or it was clearly identified by CAO Cahill that there is no contract. And I don't think, you know, we're adults, this position, the body that this position serves represents the largest voting sector within the city. They deserve to have representation from the city council. This is nothing about the person in that position now, but I think all other directors have, have a term, ha have approval. This should be no different. Thank you. Um, Council Worthley and then Council O'Neill. Yes, I will not be supporting the amendment. I appreciate Council Groh's uh, thoughts on this. Where there is no contract, nothing's changing. The mayor still has the hiring and firing authority. Um, this is no reflection on the person in the position. This is a question of a mistake that was made many years ago for a long time and we should stop making mistakes and, you know, it's do we wait till this person leaves that job? There's people in city jobs for 30 years sometimes. And I don't know that I'll be on the city council and then to remember this. So I think this is cleaning up a mistake when the position was created in the first place. And um, my guess is that the mayor will appoint and we will unanim unanimously confirm like we do most of the appointments the mayor picks. So I don't think anything changes for the person in that position. So I will be voting against the amendment because I think that there is a sense of accountability where the, the council is that um, the body that confirms all the mayor's appointments. So, um, can I, before I, before I ask Council O'Neill to speak, um, Council Grow, would you just mind repeating the amendment? Um, it would just help, I think, all of us because you read it kind of fast, and and I just want to make sure that we're all clear on this. It would be to uh, amend the main motion to indicate that the. Uh, council approval will go into effect upon the appointment of the next new director of elder services, at which point the position will to will be subject to council approval and subject to reappointment and approval every two years thereafter. Thank you. Um, council O'Neill, you were next to raise your hand. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, so I will not support the amendment. I agree with um, Council Worthley and O'Hara that it's an important position. And I have quite a large senior population in my ward. And um, I think they should be represented. And I think the way to go is to have someone appointed, whether it's the, the current woman or someone else, and go through the process. So thank you. Thank you, Council O'Neill. Any further discussion on the amendment? May I speak again? Um, so Council Gross, you haven't spoken. Can you unmute yourself? Can I make an amendment to the amendment? Yeah. Sure. I would like to um, amend it to that it takes a doesn't go till the um, end of uh, this particular person who's in this position's um, uh, tenure here, but it goes that it starts to um, the next appointment schedule that would be in odd years. So it'd be 2025. I guess my motion is, is that we change it instead of to the end of employment to um, start February uh, 15th, 2025. Nice, I'll move. Um, motion on the second amendment um, to the first amendment made by Councilor Gross. And um, is there a second? Second. second. I think it was Council Memard. Okay, so on the new amendment, um, Councilor Gross, you made it, so you may begin the narrative. Mm, pretty much made my narrative. <laughs> okay. It speaks for itself. All right, sounds good. Uh, Council Nolan, your hand is raised. I believe that in the First Amendment, it wasn't to extend the job for longevity. I believe it was to the next appointment, which would have been almost in the same cycle as a 2025. Um, so either or, um, I support both, um, but there there is a limit on it where the term does expire but I just don't want to enact it within July, saying someone may be voted or approved for the job they currently have. So um, I will support Tony Gross's amendment. Thank you, Council Nolan. Anyone else want to speak on the the third amend or the second amendment? <laughs> uh, Council Worthley. Yes, I'll be supporting Councilor Gross's amendment. The impression I got from the first amendment was that it would last as long as this person's in the position, not just for the appointment cycle. So um, this gives clarity to it. I think it's a good compromise and I'll be supporting Councilor Gross's amendment. Councilor Groh? Um, just for clarif clarification, my, my first amendment is uh, based on the, uh, the new employment of a new director appointed by the, by the mayor's office. At that, that would be at the conclusion of the um, employment of, of the current occupant of that business, of that uh, office, because again, like uh, CEO Cahill said, changing changing the uh, the rules of the game in the middle of the uh, of the game is is not fair to the employee, and you know the mayor the mayor has the uh, authority and the and the and the right to terminate that employee at any time based on job performance or whatnot. So. Um, it's it's not a job protection uh, aspect of it. Um, there's still still plenty of opportunity for uh, the, the mayor to make a new decision and uh, a new direction at some point. So um, I'm I'm comfortable with my first original amendment. I'll continue with that. Any further comments on Councilor Gross's most recent amendment, um, Councilor O'Neill? I was going to comment on Councilor Groh's amendment. We're on the new amendment right now, so we have to stay focused on this. Okay. And if this um, doesn't pass, then we'll go, so go on. Okay. I. Hmm, it sounds fair to me, so um, I probably will support this. 
Um, Council O'Hara and then Councilor Gilman. Thank you. Um, I brought this to the council, this order. Uh, I'm willing to compromise. I believe that um, Councilor Gross term is acceptable and is a good compromise. And, and th this is not, not to uh, repeat myself, but the present position, present holder of the position, there is no contract. So I think this gives good term um, for, for the for the position as a whole and for the person that presently holds the position. So I will be supporting Councillor Gross's amendment to the amendment. Thank you. And I will also be supporting Councillor Gross's amendment to the amendment for several reasons. First of all, I think that it's fair. I think that it puts um, this position, this, this job, um, in the same classification as the other ones of a similar um, position. And, um, but yet it, 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 it allows us to be fair to the present person, but also to be consistent to what we're trying to do as a council. So I will be supporting the, the most recent amendment. Any further discussion on Tony Gross's second amendment? <laughs> Seeing none, um, let's do a roll call vote on the second amendment. Um, Councillor Gross? Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Councillor Grow? You know how I feel about the second amendment, no. <laughs> no. Councillor Majota? Yes. Councillor Memard? Yes. Councillor Nolan? No. Councillor O'Hara? Yes. Council O'Neill? Yes. Council Wardley? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. The yeses have it. Seven in favor, two opposed. Now we go back to the main motion. Do uh, you want to read the second? My motion now with the new amendment? <laughs> How about Council Gross's um, amendment that we just approved, seven in favor, zero opposed? Council Gross, would you just repeat it one more time for us so everybody's clear? Unfortunately, I didn't write it down. Um, my amendment was to um, postpone the enactment of this for the next appointment to be uh, confirmed by Council to happen on November uh, 15th. July. February, February 15th. February 15th, um, 2025. 2025, and also that in the space that it has, that in the ordinance that it has, um, odd years only. Thank you. Okay, any questions, Councilor, on what we're voting on right now? We're voting on the main motion um, with the amendment of being what Tony Gross just said. Okay, so. Um, Point of information, just if I may. Okay, Council Worthy, you have the floor. So we voted on Councillor Gross's amendment and in a perfect world that somehow would make it so we don't have to vote on Councillor Gross amendment, but his is actually on the floor. I agree. Unless he's, unless he's withdrawing it or willing to withdraw it or consider withdrawing it or we'd vote, vote against it. We couldn't vote for both. We couldn't vote in favor of both essentially. I think procedurally we have to vote against it or he withdraw it or how about, no, how, about we, how about we incorporate it into the, the motion since it is effectively what you're what you you've amended my motion so let's read my motion with the amendment um joanne do you have anything to add to that because we um we voted the the most recent amendment and we voted in favor of that so my Understanding was you go back to the main motion with that new amendment because that defeated the the first amendment um, with a vote of the council. I think you have to like you should have um, voted for the met the council grows amendment, okay? And then after Tony Gross's, you can amend it twice. So, but I think you. Have Lost oh, you, John. Sorry, I was muted. I was muted. Sorry. 
Okay. So a motion can be amended twice. Okay. So what happens, I believe you should have voted for Councilor Gross's amendment and then after Councilor, Councilor Gross's amendment, then Councilor Gross could have made another amendment and you could have voted on that with the main motion. Um, Council Nolan, you chair ONA, do you have anything to add to this conversation? I do, by, by rules of procedure, we never voted up or down uh, the motion to amend by Councilor Grow. Um, that should have been a vote that we had taken first. Um, and then if there was another amendment, we should have taken that secondly. So I, I still believe that by procedure on the floor, we have an open amendment um, to the original order by Councilor Grow that we haven't voted up or down on. We went from council questions to an amendment, but not back to the first amendment that we never voted on. Yeah, you did it. Um, council Gross, you have your hand raised, and then if we yeah, um, mine was not... an amendment to the amendment, so you had to vote my amendment to Jason's <laughs> amendment, and then that changes. If it's voted in, then Jason's amendment gets changed. Yeah, now you're going to go back to Jason's amendment. Let That's me swing okay. a chance at this. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to read it. So my my motion would read, if I'm correct, the motion to, in, to indicate that the council approval will go into effect February 14th, 2025, upon the appointment of a new uh, director of elder services. And then the position will be subject to council approval and subject to reappointment approval every two years thereafter. Does that encapsulate it? Second. Second. Let's, yeah, yeah. It's right on the floor. It's right on the floor. Okay. So, so now we're back to J, um, Council Groh's amendment to the main motion. Um, so any discussion on this? Council Wordley. Yes, uh, thank you for clarifying that. It seems to me though that if we vote for this, the intent of Council Groh's, if I understand it, is that it would, wouldn't go into effect until there's a new person in that position and so if we voted this down, Councillor Gross's amendment should still stand. Is that right? Well, then I, I, we can... Uh... Well, I don't... This is what is confusing me because I think we all agreed with the spirit of Councillor Gross's amendment to the amendment in that we wanted to be clear that we wanted to get it on par with everyone else and that we thought that the date of February 15, 2025 was the first, was the proper thing to do. So, so, um, so we can clarify so this if I can. Go ahead. If we just remove the next new director and leave it as the appointment of the director of elder services, because that, that, that obviates any issue of whether it's the person in, in the position now or a okay. new position, doesn't matter. So okay. rereading it, it would be the it would indicate that the council approval will go into effect upon uh, in effect on February 14th upon the appointment of the director of elder services, at which point the position will be subject to council approval and re reapproval every two years thereafter. That, right. that should cover it. Okay. Um, so on on the um, on the first amendment. <laughs> Um, any further discussion? Um, roll call vote. Council Gross? Yes. Council Grow? Yes. Council Majota? Yes. Council Memard? Yes. Council Nolan? Yes. Council O'Hara? Yes. Council O'Neill? Yes. Council Worthley? Yes. Councilor Gilman, yes, the yeses have it. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Now we have to go back to the whole motion with this new amendment. Anyone like to speak to the motion with this new amendment? Um, Council Memard and Council Gross, you have the floor, Council Memard. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly be supporting this and I appreciate my fellow councilors bringing their focus and attention to this. Uh, as everybody has pointed out, our, our senior community 
is an important uh, and a significant component of Gloucester and deserve uh, all of our attention. Uh, I appreciate the uh, Council on Aging and the Friends on the Council of Aging, Howard uh, Frisch's and, and Frank Bellini's comments and, and the work that they do in support of our Senior Center, the Rose Baker Senior Center and the uh, Council on Aging. And I, I think that they're appropriate advocates for the importance of this director of, of senior services, elder services. So I will be supporting. Thank you, Councilor Member. Um, I think it was Councilor Gross. Did you have your hand out? I did. I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that we also added in there that it's on odd years. Never two years. Yeah. Two. Oh, it's odd years. It's written already in the um, the language that's in there has a blank, and it just oh. my my amendment had odd years in. Joanne gets it. Okay. Um, Council Gross, a uh, grow. Go ahead. I I I, um, I just want to make a, a statement of clarification because anybody who's watching at home is shaking their head, saying, "Why did you just vote for the main the, the amendment that you just voted against?" In retrospect, I probably should have voted against that because I still believe that it's unfair to the uh, to the current occupant. Uh, so that, unfortunately, is my mistake. Not that it makes any difference in the count of the vote, um, but the sentiment is still there. Uh, I will be supporting the overall um, motion, however, because I do believe the position is warrants the, uh, the the elevation to to this level of a position. Uh, I just wanted to be very clear that that. Uh, uh, I would have probably voted against my own amendment with the changes in it, but that's neither Thank here you, nor Council. there. Anyone else like to speak to this? Council Worthley. Yes, I just want to thank the people who spoke tonight and all your advocacy for the Council on Aging, the Friends of the Council on Aging, and also I think Council Gilman plays a, a significant role uh, in that organization as well. It's, it's an important job, and I think that um, elevating this and having Council confirmation makes sense. And uh, I really appreciate what the work that is happening and needs to continue to happen at the Senior Center. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. And to Council Worthley's comment, I do serve as an ex officio non-voting member of the Council on Aging Board, um, but there's no conflict. Um, so, but anyway, thank you so much, Councilors. Any further discussion before we vote? Seeing none, roll call vote, Council Gross. Yes. Council Grow. Yes. Council Majota. Yes. Council Memard. Yes. Council Nolan. Yes. Council Hera. Yes. Council O'Neill. Yes. Council Worthley. Yes. Council Gilman. Yes. The yeses have it. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Good, good uh, lesson on parliamentary procedures, councillors. Um, that was very helpful. So next order of business, Madam Clerk. Next order of business is the second public hearing, public hearing 2023-007, Special City Council Permit 2023-002, Addison Street, number 29, map 25, lot 51, Gloucester Zoning Ordinance, section 2.3.1, parentheses 8, conversion to or new multifamily or apartment dwelling, seven or more units, section 3.1.6B, building heights in excess of 35 feet, in sections 3.2.2, dimensional requirements for multifamily dwellings and their accessory uses, parentheses other than signs for the conversion of a five family to an eight family dwelling, keeping the built-in height at 36 feet in dimensional requirements. I'd like to open the public hearing and ask um, attorney Joel Favaza to, um, to speak in favor of this. Thank you very much. I'll get my screen share moving along for everybody. Um, while this loads, for the record, my name is Joel Pavaza. I'm an attorney at Seaside Legal Solutions, 123 Main Street in Gloucester. I am here tonight on behalf of Churchill Corner Apartments, LLC. Jay Stratton Moore is the principal of that LLC. He owns a few apartment buildings here in downtown Gloucester. So the proposed work it's actually um, separated into two buildings. What is formerly known as 29 Addison Street has two houses on it. This yellow one is known um, from a postal standpoint as 44 School Street. As far as the city maps, 
uh, and lots go. There is no 44 School Street. This is strictly a postal address. Both of the buildings I'm talking about tonight are on the same lot, and the legal address is 29 Edison Street. For clarity's sake, you'll hear me talk about the yellow building tonight as 44 School Street, because that's what everyone uh, in the neighborhood knows it as. So for 44 School Street, this yellow building, it is currently a two-unit residential building. We're looking to convert it to a three-unit residential building. This is the only building that's actually physically receiving a new unit with this permitting. What I mean by that is 29 Addison Street, which is the gray building, has um, currently and has had historically, as far as I can tell from city records, probably about 40 years, five units in the building. However, while the assessor's office has been assessing it as a five unit building, the building department has no records of any authority allowing it to go beyond three units. So from a legal standpoint, the permit you would grant tonight if you vote in favor of this would technically convert this from a legal three to a legal five. However, pragmatically, it is just retroactively permitting two uh, apartments that already exist in this building. So again, we are only physically building one new apartment that's in uh, the School Street building, the yellow building. We are legally retroactively permitting existing units inside the gray building known as 29 Addison Street. Brief background here, as I mentioned, there are two existing structures on the lot. Um, two structures <coughs> are allowed on a lot when it is not a single or two family. Multifamily is gonna have multiple buildings. Uh, and there have been seven separate dwelling units in total on the property. Again, although the city only has a combined record of allowing for five, that would be two in the yellow building, 44 school, and three in the gray building, 29 Addison. Um, we have the R5 high density residential district. Uh, both the buildings and the layout of the lot are long standing. The assessors has both buildings pegged around 1850. And as you can see from the picture of this 1899 Atlas, these houses have been in their uh, current footprints and locations for quite some time. None of the work proposed is going to alter the height or exterior um, shell of these buildings. My client acquired the lot in 2018. Uh, my office did not handle his acquisition, but when he was going through this as part of due diligence, he hired a uh, zoning solutions company that provided him a certificate stating that the property was um, legally pre-existing non-conforming with seven units and that the seven units could remain as a matter of right. It was not until he was renovating um, the buildings, the building department flagged there were quote, too many units in this uh, existing five family. And when we went to go add the unit into the yellow building is when we had to kind of go back and, and fix everything. So I wanna be very clear because there were some misconceptions, uh, at least at the zoning board level, when we first started this, that my client had added units illegally himself and was trying to retroactively permit them. That is not the case. He relied upon the expert, the expert knowledge of professionals who gave him unfortunate, incorrect advice when he was doing his due diligence. And he, uh, through no fault of his you know, own, ended up purchasing a building that had uh, units that were not properly permitted previously. As I mentioned, we went to the ZBA. Um, they gave a special permit for a lesser number of off-street parking spaces and a pile of variances. As you can imagine, those two buildings tight on that lot do not meet lot area, front yard setback, side yard setback, et cetera. So we had to get a pile of variances from the ZBA, uh, as well as a special permit for a lesser number of off-street spaces. We have that. And so that brings me to what I'm here asking you all for tonight. Uh, I'm asking for a use permit. That would be a seven or more unit multifamily special permit. Um, I'm also asking for a height permit. Again, the yellow house, 44 School Street, is 36 feet tall. And uh, the rule in Gloucester is that when you are changing use lines, so if you look at the use table um, in the GZO, if you're going from one line on the use table to another, you have to go re-permit or re-allow all your dimensions, which is why I had to go to the ZBA, get all those variances, and then come to you to get a height permit because it's above 35 feet. And I also need a special permit to decrease the lot area and open space per dwelling unit. As you can see from this chart, it's these three yellow lines. The rest of this relief has already been requested and granted by the ZBA. These are just the three pieces that the zoning ordinance says the city council can grant. This is just a collection of the plans. Again, this just shows you the existing lot. Uh, one thing I do wanna make note of 
is that um, it's showing two conforming parking spaces. If you read the section on off-street parking in the zoning ordinance, there's certain dimensional regulations that have to be followed. But the reality is there is room um, next to 44 school for an snow emergency to fit practically, um, you know, or pragmatically four, four cars. You just end up blocking um, the first two cars in, which do not qualify then as legal parking spaces from a zoning ordinance standpoint. But when I show two parking spaces, there's obviously much more room than just two cars worth of room. These are just the floor plans of what we call 29 Addison Street. This is the gray building. Nothing is highlighted in red because nothing is changing. This is the layout of the building as it is. This is 44 School Street. This is the basement, no changes. This is the first floor, no changes. This will remain a standalone unit, two bedroom, one bath unit, the kitchen and a living room. The second floor, there's a little bit of interior alteration. You see some doors are being added or removed. A bedroom is being added. This will be unit number two, which will be a standalone unit on the second floor. Then we have um, the third floor. We're adding a kitchen and a bathroom. This will have one bedroom on this level. And you go up the, the uh, set of stairs on the left here up to the top level, which is currently attic. And this will be all new construction, interior only, adding two bedrooms and a full bathroom up here. So this will be a three bedroom unit on the top two floors of the building itself. Uh, again, here's the aerial shot we saw. Here are the pictures that were included in the file. I'm just going to scroll through these. If anyone has any questions, I can happily go back later on. And so now we get to the lawyer stuff, which is no fun, but we have to go through it. Now I make sure that we're on the record doing it the right way. So we have standards you have to apply. One is section 1.8.3. You have to show that, or I have to show you, and you have to accept that the proposed use will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the GZO and that it'll not have any adverse effects on the neighborhood, zoning district, et cetera. Um, and not that it can't have any negative effects, period, but it just can't have negative effects that outweigh the beneficial effects of the use itself. So this is the six part test, which uh, per your last city council meeting will be a seven part test come June. Um, social, economic, community needs. I think this is a big one. So you'll notice I have two bullets here. One's talking about little A affordable and big A affordable. Just to be clear, the inclusionary housing requirements will trigger um, if this permit is granted. So there will be a formally restricted um, big A affordable unit. However, it is not necessarily going to be the one that is being created new. So even if the affordable restriction goes on to an existing unit in one of the two buildings, you're still creating what will be a pragmatically affordable building, uh, affordable unit in that 44 School Street building itself. Um, this is a building that is convenient to um, public transportation, both CADA and the MBTA. And it's important to remember that in 2017, we spent a lot of money on a study as a city that said by 2022, we needed to, to create just over 600 units of housing. And we are still 300 units short of where we were supposed to be last year to prevent a housing crisis. And I think we're seeing, um, as the report suggested, the, the housing crisis that it was warning about take hold in the city. Um, so this is, again, you know, it's just one more unit, but every little bit helps toward getting to that point where there are sufficient number of units for people to live here in Gloucester. Uh, traffic flow and safety. So again, we have the two existing spaces. Pragmatically, there are four. I'm not here for parking relief technically because the ZBA has the jurisdiction already granted it, but obviously you want to take into effect the impact that this unit will have on traffic. Again, as I mentioned, we are close to long-term public parking. We are close to MBTA uh, commuter rail station and we're close to the downtown. These are actually ideal units for those who do not have or do not want a vehicle. I can live in this building. I can walk to Shaw's. I can walk to the post office. I can walk to city hall. I can walk um, to Walgreens. I can get on the train. I can get on the CADA, right? I can dial up the uh, the app for CADA on demand and go wherever else I might need to go. This is not a part of the city that requires you to have a car in order to survive. And some people are drawn to these apartments for that reason. Um, nevertheless, I think it's also important to rem remember we are in downtown Gloucester and the addition or deletion of one housing unit is not going to have an appreciable effect on the traffic patterns that you notice down there. Adequacy of utilities, they're totally sufficient. We are in a dense district that has high, um, high capacity utilities in the street. The utilities are already servicing the seven units in the building. Neighborhood character and social structure. Again, this is a neighborhood full of multifamily homes. This is a property in the R5 district. And if you look at what the zoning ordinance calls, it calls it the highest, not even high density, the highest density residential district in the city. 
And uh, for anyone walking up and down the street, the exterior of the structures, um, aside from being, you know, uh, improved and that they're being repaired, they're not changing uh, visually. They're not getting any bigger. They're not getting reconfigured. They're not moving around. Uh, anyone who walked down the street, you know, before this permit granted and then walked down the street after this permit was granted would see essentially the same thing. Quality is the natural environment. There's no impact here and potential fiscal impact. Uh, for both the applicant and the city, obviously an additional dwelling unit adds new growth tax revenue to the city, which is the only way you get around the, the ceiling of uh, Prop 2.5. And then for the property owner, the fiscal impact, uh, this allows him to, um, to receive additional revenue. And this revenue is going to be used to provide the capital upgrades required, along with um, the normal building repairs, uh, because those five units in 29 Addison, in the gray building, are only being permitted for the first time legally, even though they're pre-existing, my client is gonna to have to install a sprinkler system uh, in that building, which again is a benefit for the neighborhood, benefit for public safety, but it's a very expensive undertaking. And it's gonna take years of um, rent coming in from the new unit to ever make back what it's gonna to cost to get those uh, sprinklers installed. So that's the, the use permit special, uh, standard. And then we go to the height standard. This one's a lot easier to work with. You just have to make sure the height is consistent with the neighborhood and will not be detrimental to the neighborhood because of obstruction of views, et cetera. I think this one's a pretty easy one because if it's the same result, whether you grant this permit or not from, again, the, the neighborhood perspective, the building height is not gonna change. So if you approve this building uh, height exception, nothing changes. The shadow pattern views all stay the same. Conversely, if you, for some reason, were to deny tonight's permits, you still wouldn't be changing the shadow pattern, the views, et cetera. These houses are what they are and will continue to just kind of be what they are. We just <laughs> technically need the approval here. Uh, and then the decrease in lot area and open space for dwelling unit. The only standard here is to make sure that if you are to reduce it, that it's in keeping with the neighborhood character and structural density. Again, um, as the unit count goes up, the square footage per lot, I'm uh, sorry, per unit goes down, but it's only 12.5%. Again, it's a pragmatic to these two um, buildings on this lot make sense in the neighborhood, the historic buildings in this neighborhood, I think they do. Um, and then you look around the neighborhood and I would, you know, I'd be surprised to find any multifamilies that really uh, complied with the lot coverage or uh, sorry, the lot area per dwelling unit or open space requirements in this area. So I think it's non-compliance fits in with the neighborhood character more than uh, a compliant building would, which would look a little bit, a bit out of place, a lot of extra green space that would be, um, you know, not seen elsewhere in the neighborhood itself. So in conclusion, we're not making any changes to either exterior of the building. We are not adversely impacting the neighborhood. We are benefiting the city by adding one more unit of housing in an area where housing is desperately needed. Um, and as we discussed, or as I discussed a moment ago, I believe we've met the requirements for all three special permits. Anyone who's making a motion, those would be the three permits that we would be looking for. Uh, an eight unit multifamily permit, 36 foot above average grade height permit and relief of 1,125 square feet of open space per dwelling unit and 1,863.25 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit. I thank you for coming with me on that long journey. I will end my screen share now. Thank you, Joel, for that presentation. Anyone else like to speak in favor of this? Let me just check. <clears throat> Could we all mute ourselves um, in, unless you're speaking? Um, so let's see. I see no hands. Anyone like to speak in opposition? Um, Beverly Palmici. Beverly, would you introduce yourself? And um, you have three minutes. Um, and I think Joanne, if you don't mind keeping track of that and giving me a 10 second warning, that would be great. Beverly, welcome, introduce yourself and your address and you have three minutes to speak okay. to us. Beverly Palmacci, 8 Commonwealth Avenue. I have questions actually, I, it's not for or against. Uh, I'm curious as to there are now seven apartments, correct? Legally. That is correct. Right, do we know how many cars the tenants have now that they're parking. Um, so we parking. can we can now, we can save that for council questions. Um, so we're keeping track of that. 
Council Thank you. Person? Okay. Uh, and I would just like to mention that uh, across the street from me, there is a five unit building that as I understand it is grandfathered in with no parking spaces. And I can tell you that's a problem to have five apartments with no parking spaces. We just don't have that many parking spaces. And last year there was a house on Well Street, the half of Well Street towards Dunkin' Donuts that was trying to put a third floor on. And I believe they were turned down because they did not have a parking space to accommodate the third floor. So I'm, I'm just curious about this. I don't know how this works in terms of, do you have to be grandfathered in to have apartments with no parking? Uh, I'm surprised that this passed the, the, the ZBA actually. I didn't get to attend that meeting, but I'm just curious as to how this works. Okay, and we can we will keep track of those questions and we'll make sure that we ask them and council the questions. Thank you, Beverly. Okay, thank you. Anyone else like to speak and I'll say open it up to any either favor or opposition. I don't see any more hands. Joanne, do you? No, I do not. Okay. So at this point, counselors, this is time for council questions. So um, who would like to ask any questions? And if any of you would like to mention the questions that were brought up by Beverly, please feel free. Um, I'm gonna call on Council Mijota because he had his hand raised first. But Joanne had a, her hand raised as well. Okay. Oh. Um, you didn't ask if I had any communications before the Oh question. my gosh, twice in a night. Geez, usually I'm on my game. Um, so, <laughs> no um, Madam Clerk, do you have any communications to share with us? There are no communications. Please Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so we're going to go back to Council Majota, and then I see Council Nolan, and um, and then Council Worthley. Um, and let's try to let's try to keep these to three minute total uh, questions. And um, Joanne, if you can do your count, that would be great. And it's only for when you're asking the question that we stop it um, if we're having something answered. So uh, Council Majota, you have the floor. Okay, I'll ask Beverly's question. Do you know how many cars um, are there for that particular unit? And in the 20, 29 Addisons, are all the units occupied currently? Those are my only two uh, questions. Yes, sir. So I, I do not know how many of the uh, how many cars belong to those buildings right now. I do know that not every tenant in that building has a car. Twenty nine Addison is fully occupied. Forty four is not due to the the renovation that was started and halted. Yeah. Um. Go ahead, Council Majota. You still have the floor. I'm gonna. I'll let the other councilors ask um, questions. Um. I'll just. And then they might ask the same questions that I have. Okay, thank you. Council Nolan, your hand was raised. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to point out that uh, Beverly as a question as being important. Um, it's not one that's on the criteria of what we're voting tonight. Um, the vote is on the height and land use and, and uh, square footage. Uh, although she makes a great point with off street parking and dense zones, but I don't think that we need to answer that or, or have the ability to answer that correctly because that's not what's in front of us. Any other questions, counselors? Council Worthley. Yes, thank you. Um, to attorney for Vaza, um, I have a couple of questions. Some I know the answer to, some I don't, so I'm just gonna run through them. How much higher is this building going to be than the current, the current building? Zero feet. How much closer to the sidewalk is this gonna be? Zero feet. How much more space on the property is this gonna be taking up? Zero feet more lot coverage. Okay. Do you know when the building was, was built? According to the assessors, 1850. I found it on an atlas in 1899 where they're in the same footprint and orientation they're in currently. Okay. And when did our zoning code come into place? The first zoning code came into place in 1929, major updates in the 50s and 60s. This modern one was overhauled in 2008. Right. 
So there's a point which I'll make in the discussion in this, but thank you for helping with that. Um, you mentioned that because of this procedural step that there will be sprinkling of the three units, is that right? There'll be sprinkling of the five unit building, actually. The three unit building will not require it. Okay. I don't certainly want to add more costs, but can there be some consideration for sprinkling the whole building at some point? Because if the side that's not sprinkled catches on fire, then obviously it has an impact on everybody. Certainly, um, if the three unit building were ever to, if <laughs> ever to trip the, the requirement, he would obviously comply but at this point. Um, the, the cost of sprinkling existing kind of closed structure is really astronomical. So we got to stick to the, the five unit for now. I understand. Uh, my last question is, I, I think that this triggers the affordable unit, as you mentioned, and I think that should be thanks to Councillor Grow because he submitted the legislation to officially make existing units, even if we were to formally approve them, to trip that um, requirement. So kudos to Councillor Grow. I guess that was comments, not um, questions, but that's a new change as of last year, I believe. Yes, when we first started exploring this, it was not going to trigger this requirement and uh, Councillor Grow changed the game before the game was over or whatever that, that uh, saying was. <laughs> I, I didn't even know you were playing at that point. <laughs> I have no further questions right now. Thank you. Um, Councillor Grow and then Councillor Gross. Um, yeah, well, some games we can change, some games we can't, right? Um, question I have for you, uh, uh, Councillor Favaza, is um, what happens if we don't approve this permit tonight to the five unit building? The five unit building would then be under an enforcement order to reduce down to a three unit building. Um, and the two unit building could not convert to three units. So instead of having eight units, we'd be down to five units. Across the both buildings total, yes. All right. Same number of bedrooms. What you we'd then have is you'd have a five bedroom unit, you'd do a roommate situation. So mm -hmm. you don't actually, you know, you'll decrease the density of people living in the building. You just right. decrease the legal separation. But we would also lose the capital A affordable unit as well. Correct. And the sprinklers. And the sprinklers. Thank you. I'm done. Any other, any uh, all right. So um, I think Council Gross had your hand raised. And then, no, um, Council O'Neill, is your hand raised? Yeah. Council O'Neill, you are muted. Thank you. So you said if this doesn't get approved, um, Joel, that the five unit building will go down to a three unit building? Is that what you said? Yes, because the building department only has record of it being a legal three family. So they'd have to take out some two kitchens, I guess, and convert what are currently, you know, smaller units into much larger units. Okay. Um, those five units are occupied, all five? Yes. All right, thank you. Any further questions, counselors? Council O'Hara. This is just a general question on the landlord. Um, Joel, do you know how many buildings or how many units total that uh, Mr. Moore may own in the entire city of Gloucester? More than 10, less than 20 is my guess, but it's just a guess. That's more than 10 buildings no no more than 10 units yeah yes understood yeah, okay. more than 10 units okay. of housing less than 20 i believe potentially more. Okay. again I, I don't I, the answer the answer is i don't know right but this is my my best guess for you Councilor O'Hara. right right okay thank you any other further questions to our applicant counselors seeing none I'd like to close the public hearing and ask for the committee report from Council Grow. Council Grow, could you unmute yourself? I just realized as soon as I said it. On uh, a motion of Council Grow, seconded by Council Gilman, Planning and Development Committee voted two in favor, one opposed, O'Neill, to recommend that the City Council grant the Churchill Corner Apartment LLC a special permit, a special council permit 2023-002, for the property located at Addison Street, number 29, Assessor's Map 25, Lot 51, R5 District, pursuant to Gloucester Zoning Ordinance, Section 2.3.18, to 
Conversion to or new multifamily or apartment dwelling, seven or more dwelling units for the conversion of a five family to an eight family dwelling and pursuant to Gloucester Zoning Ordinance 3.1.6B, building heights in excess of 35 feet for the building to remain at 36 feet and pursuant to Gloucester Zoning Ordinance 3.2.2 dimensional requirements for multifamily dwellings and their accessory uses other than signs for minimal minimum lot space per dwelling unit and minimum open space per dwelling unit as follows. The minimum lot area per dwelling unit in square feet. The required dimension is 2,500. The existing dimension is 727.71 with a proposed dimension of 636.75 per unit, which would relieve, would result in a, in a granted relief of 1,863.25 feet and a minimum open space per dwelling unit in square feet, required dimensions 1,250 square feet. The existing dimension is 142.86 per unit. The proposed dimension is 125 feet per unit, resulting in a granted relief of 1,125 feet um, for the open space per dwelling unit. This uh, permit is made on the basis of plans and elevations dated August 28, 2019, four plans for 29 Addison and submitted to the city clerk on January 30th, 2023, entitled basement plan, proposed first floor plan, proposed second floor plan, and proposed attic plan. And also made on the basis of plans and elevations for 44 School Street, five plans dated July 6th, 2021, entitled existing basement plan, July 7th, 2021, entitled first floor existing plan, July 7th, 2021, entitled Second Floor Proposed and Permitted Plan. July 7th, 2021, entitled Third Floor Proposed Plan. And July 6th, 2021, entitled Attic Floor Proposed Plan and submitted to the City Clerk on January 23rd, 2023. Subject to new information and or debate that results from the public hearing, the special permit is deemed to be in harmony with the intent and purposes of the zoning ordinance and I so move. Second. Second. Well, <laughs> motion made by Councilor Grow, and I believe I heard Councilor Worthley with a second. And Councilor. Um, and um, so, Councilor Grow, I will go back to you to begin the discussion um, and, and do the narrative. Representing okay. I think on word count, Scott still has the record for this evening in terms of motions. Uh, well done. Um, as far as as far as the the the, uh, the committee report and the, the narration, um, it's it's pretty self evident that what we're doing here is we're adding uh, one unit to a building that can contain and easily uh, accept an additional unit. Um, by accepting this and granting this permit, we are legalizing all the units in this building. Uh, we are triggering the inclusionary housing ordinance, which uh, gives us an, a deed restricted affordable unit in perpetuity. Um, we are uh, preventing the loss of units by, if we don't accept the permit or don't agree to, to the permit, we potentially lose three units uh, of much needed housing in the city. So it's definitely a net gain uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the city. The um, uh, conditions of 1.8.3, um, I think the uh, attorney Pavaza clearly articulated uh, that the social, economic and community needs were served uh, that traffic flow and safety is going to be a minimal issue. Adequacy of utilities is substantially uh, uh, present. Neighborhood character and social structure, it is, uh, fits into the neighborhood as it is now. And such a change of an additional unit is not going to change. That the qualities of the natural environment are not going to substantially change. And the potential fiscal impact and the addition of the affordable unit uh, are definitely positive um, attributes to this permit. So I fully support it. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of the council supporting it as well. Thank you, Councilor Grow. So our rules of procedure say, um, we're gonna try to each keep it to three minutes, um, rules of procedure for debate. Um, so if you don't mind, um, Madam Clerk, if you could help time that, that would be great. Um, Councilor Grow. 
I, I did want to add, I, I missed a couple things that I wanted to, to say in this and I, I cut it short. One, okay, and we'll give you longer than three minutes because you're representing P and D. You know, I, I don't, I don't, so. I don't need, I don't, I'm fine after this. But basically, okay. uh, you know, the applicant's already been to the ZBA where they've they've re received the requisite uh, setback requirements and the parking uh, relief. And the parking relief, while I understand the parking issue uh, in the neighborhood is is not in our purview. That relief has already been granted. Um, they, uh, the the um, uh, all the setbacks and the requirements that the ZBA have already considered aren't going to change, as Councilor Worsley pointed out in his questions. Zero changes to the uh, to the neighborhood in that regard. So, again, uh, there's pretty much uh, other than the potential for a possible new car. Um, I don't think that's enough to uh, throw this application off track. So that's it. Thank you, Councilor Grow. Okay, councilors, open this up for debate. Um, Council Wordley, the floor, and then yes, Council Memmard. Thank you, and I'll be efficient here. Um, I will be supporting this. I think the um, applicant and the, the attorney did a great job explaining it. Um, I, I think we. This is not the first time we've had this sort of thing happen, where an existing use or existing structure is not changing. And I understand if there's a tremendous change of use, but I think at some point we need to have a, a whole other conversation. It would involve the building inspectors off, the administration and the council to say, you know, this, this applicant came before us or before the city three years ago, and that's a unit of housing that hasn't been on the dock, hasn't been available for three years. And I don't want to begrudge my friends in the legal industry. Um, I respect the profession, but they're not free. And that adds more cost, which then gets reflected in the rents. So I, I think that we could, and I don't know how to do it yet, but we should take an initiative to review some of these things that just say, okay, if you're not changing the structure, if you're a 36 foot high building for the last 200 years, and you got to get a motion an application change because you're going from, you're not changing at all, but because our, our rules say 35, I don't think this should be a special counsel hearing on something like that. It just takes up a lot of time that, I don't mind the time, but the applicant and the renters uh, are spending money to have an existing building do exactly what the existing building is supposed to do. So I don't know how to get there, but I think we should at some point do a deep dive into this. I'll be supporting this um, application. Thank you. Um, I forget who I had told would be on deck. Council Memard. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joel, for your presentation. I thought you, co you covered all the bases. Um, I agree with the points that Councillor Grow made in reviewing this application and the, the three variances that are being sought. And, and again, the parking in the neighborhood is a concern. This, uh, this obviously doesn't alleviate that situation, but again, it's not within our purview. Um, and there are, in fact, um, families and folks that will take advantage of this who will not bring cars to the, the, to the this equation, they'll be car free and, and uh, able to enjoy all the amenities of downtown Gloucester without clog, clog, clogging up the streets further. So I will be supporting this as presented. Anyone else like to um, discuss this, councilors? Uh, Council Nolan and then Council O'Hara. Joel, great job. Um, basically, Councilor Grow. Worthley and Memhard has said everything that I'd like to say. This is a great thing and I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor O'Hara. Thank you. Um, I want to, I will be supporting this. The addition of fire sprinklers, uh, which save lives, is a tremendous asset to the city, uh, <laughs> to the neighbors, to the um, apartment dwellers. Also, the applicant is well known. Uh, he, he has a lot of structures and he's a good landlord. He's reasonable with his tenants, uh, which I think is extremely important to, to the city of Gloucester and to all residents who are apartment dwellers. Thank you. Um, Councilor O'Neill. Thank you. Can I ask Joel a question at this time or is that? Um, well, we have to amend the rules of procedure. Um, counselors, we need a, um, is there a second to amend the rules of procedures to go back in the public hearing? I don't think you need a motion. You could, without objection, suspend the rules, right? 
Okay. Last time I did that mm -hmm. and somebody said that I should have taken a, um, oh. a roll call vote. Okay. So um, um, without objection, I will go back and um, allow Council, uh, Joe Favaza to answer the question that Council O'Neill had just stated. The Thank floor you. is yours. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because there are no um, renovations happening in the five unit building, that's correct, right? <laughs> The renovations in the five unit are actually complete. They've gone through and rehabbed that building already. Okay, so when they rehabbed it, they did not put sprinklers in? Uh, no, that was one of the things that kind of stopped the work. The, the building department said, hold up. Um, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry for giving you the permit. It looks like you're only supposed to have three units in there and you have five. And we said, okay, we'll, we'll get that you know, made retroactively okay. And we'll, we'll hold up again. If you go from three to five legally, now you need to sprinkle the building. So this is all being triggered by the interior renovation work that was started back in 2019. Is is there a timeline when the sprinklers will be installed? Or is there a, a deadline? Like within a year or with six months, three months? Yeah, so um, he'll be required to exercise any relief granted tonight within a year. An exercise typically means recording the decision, pulling a building permit and commencing work. And then um, if he delays in actually doing the work or completing the work in the permit, at some point the building department can say, hey, we're gonna, you know, you're putting your occupancy permits at risk because of an open permit that's not been completed. Thank you. So um, I will be supporting this. I know I, I voted against it at p and but I, I believe um, the sprinkler system far outweighs the parking space, which, you know I'm a stickler about parking, um, but I think it, it's a safety thing, and I think it, it's a good thing to have those sprinklers. So I will be supporting this, and I hope Beverly's not too upset with me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Any further discussions, councillors? Um, so I would like to speak on behalf of this permit. Um, first of all, <clears throat> It's a use permit, seven or more um, units, and that requires standards to be applied. And I believe that um, Attorney Favaza did a great job in describing that, um, that um, the utilities are totally sufficient, plus the new sprinkler system. Um, neighborhood character and social structure, there's no external changes, so nothing is different. Um, and um, there's a potential fiscal appeal to this and um, obviously the fact that we're going to have a big a additional affordable housing um, is awesome so um, and and then on the um, the height permit 3.1.6 um, there's no changes to the height so that definitely is a no-brainer so um, seeing all that on the table and the fact that in our vetting at p and d we went through all the details of the permitting and when things were filed, everything looked really tight and um, I will be supporting this. I think it's good for the neighborhood and um, attorney Favazi did a nice job presenting to us. So thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Um, seeing none, I think we're ready for a roll call vote. So let me get back to my list of names. Hmm. I've got piles everywhere right now, so it's been a long day for me. Okay, gross, uh, Councilor Gross. Which one, gross or grow? Gross. I think I said, I think gross is first tonight. Yes. Councilor Grow. Yes. Councilor Majota. Yes. Councilor Memard. Yes. Councilor Nolan. Yes. Councilor O'Hara. Yes. Council O'Neill? Council Worthley? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. The yeses have it. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Thank Joel. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. Councilor Nolan has his hand up. Oh, Council Nolan. I'm going to have to leave you guys at this point. I have something I have to take care of. So I want to wish you all a good night. Thank you. Okay. Good night, Counselor. 
Night night. <laughs> And the next, some of us still have senses of humor. So, we had um, next order of business. Oh, Council O'Hara has his hand up. Okay, Council O'Hara. Yes, I, I too like to bid farewell to everyone and thank everyone for their time and have a nice evening. Okay, thank you, Council O'Hara. Nice. Drive safe. Um, next order of business, Madam Clerk. The update on a timetable to return to Kairos Auditorium for full city council meetings with a hybrid option to the public and possible council vote on timeline and start time. Okay. Um, so there's an easy part of this, which is start time. And Council Worthy brought that up in his order. And I don't think that that would be a bad thing if anybody wanted to. Um, to make a recommendation that we want to keep our starting time to six o'clock, um, be my guest to make a motion. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry. My my uh, order that we submitted to o a is about the end time. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that we'd be voting on the start time at this point. Um, Council Grow. If uh, Jeff wants to stick with the end of times, I'll go with beginning of times. Uh, I'll make a motion to uh, to start the meetings at 6 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Okay, goodness. Um, Council Grove, seconded by Council Memard. Is there a discussion, Councilors? Council O'Neill. Yes, if, if we start at 6, if, can we add or amend your motion? to end at 10. Sure. That, that would be what we would, um, yes, that would be the that would be the time because the 11 o'clock was really developed around a seven o'clock start and going back to six, um, right. we could certainly do that. But um, so we might be jumping be ahead if that's part of our rules of procedure. Um, Council Gross, go ahead. Council O'Neill, you, um, you have a follow-up question. Well, I don't want it to be assumed that it should be put into the motion that if we start at six, we end at 10. Um, I don't want it to be just assumed. It should be. Okay. Um, Council Grow, you made the motion. Do you, would you we, like to? We have a, a little bit of a procedural issue and that is that we've referred Jeff's motion to governance and ONA and we really shouldn't be voting the time change tonight at all. Okay until we get okay. all these things done. But I think we can- yeah, That's fine. We can, we can procedurally hold on that. That's fine. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to, um, I'm, I'm anticipating that we're going to have to be um, posting a lot of our meetings as public hearings. And I just wanted to make sure that we were all in the same um, wavelength. Um, but- We can talk about- That's fine. The timeline no, we, for getting back to Cairo is definitely. Yeah, so, let, so let's, um, let's go back to um, the agenda item. And um, I have a couple things to add. I think at our last meeting, you, I was very clear that on February 17th, our IT director, Ryan Knowles, had um, um, received a contract. Um, and it said that um, it would be eight to 12 weeks from February 17th in order to have um, full hybrid at Kairos. And so that would mean that it would either be the second week in April, if it was on the fast track, or the, the second meeting in April, or the second meeting in May, if it was on the slower track of 12 weeks. Joanne and I looked at the calendars, and that's what we um, deduced from, from that. Um, the, um, the products have not arrived yet, according to our CAO, Jill Cahill. Um, so... I guess that that is uh, that that might be leaning towards the 12 week. Um, I can't confirm that, but that is an estimate. And then, um, so I just wanted to get your opinions in terms of what you wish us to do. Um, you know, the alter we have, there, we have two different alternatives. One is to just pause until the end of May or whatever day it is. If it's sooner than that, um, as long as we're in concert with posting for our public hearings in the newspapers, we need to know well enough in advance. That's one option. So just wait <coughs> um, and until B, B 
becoming true hybrid with both being present, the public being able to be present and the remote technology. So people that wanna zoom in from home can do that. Or um, there have been some comments um, from counselors that they might prefer to go back to Kairos um, as soon as we can, um, provided um, that Studio 1623 can go back to videotaping the meeting so that they can be broadcasted live. Um, and that would mean that for that duration until the date that true hybrid could occur, that um, we would not be doing Zoom recorded um, meetings for people to, to complement either being in person at Kairos with the option of dialing in and participating. Um, so those are the two options. So I just wanted to throw it out for a conversation um, and also to let you know that um, there are a couple of empty spots right now with, um, with our um, Studio 1623 in terms of details of a memorandum of understanding um, in terms of when they would be able to start videotaping our meetings again which is part of the contract. Um, so Council Wordley, your hand is raised. Yes, so I think this is a very important dialogue for us to have, but I'd like to frame it first in the question of, there's an expiration date for that the state is giving us of March uh, 31st for Zoom. Do we have a, is there a state Senate vote on that? Do we know what our, we have any other choice? So the, so, th as I had said to you, because um, our city clerk had asked us, I had asked her to um, to reach out to Ted Costa on this, mm -hmm. who is um, an aide to um, Senator Tarr, is that the uh, the House approved an extension, um, I believe it was until 2025. March of 2025 to allow for continuation of the emergency order. Is that correct, Joanne? Yes, it is. Okay. And then the Senate was going to be voting on this um, last week, and I don't have an update on to the specifics of their vote. And then at that point this week, it was to go in front of um, the governor for approval. Um, so did we get um, an update from Ted Costa on the um, on that matter, Joanne? Do you remember? No, we have not. Okay. He, he had just said that it was going to be in front of the governor this week. He didn't specify which date or which okay. date this week. Um, so okay. I think so, that's sort of a, a variable we need to understand that we may not even have a choice to make, right? Um, and then I think the second thing is. Um, you know, we talked about this literally March of last year or April of last year, and I understand I've got great, great respect for our IT department. I understand that you said there was um, information on February 18th, but it's been a year of us trying to get hybrid. Um, you know, as far as safety, we've got kids back in school for the last two years now. I don't think that, that we have that reason to say we couldn't socially distance or have our meetings in person. Um, I would love to have hybrid, but I, I think what will happen is if we voted to go in person, I think the pressure would be on the administration with respect to find a solution versus if the, if the governor says we can continue this and kick this can down the road for another year and a half, two years, I think we'll be doing Zoom meetings forever. And um, I think there's value in us meeting in person and um, working quickly to get it to be as hybrid, have it be hybrid shortly thereafter. Okay. Um, Councilor Grow, would you like to comment? Yeah, as, 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 as the councilor who, who swore he didn't want to leave his house at all during this term, um, I have to say that I've, I've come around to the, uh, the real, you know, the, the reality is that we should be back in, in person. Um, you know, my concerns last year, uh, continuing on was that there seemed to be a rush to get back to in-person meetings and it, it wasn't um, it wasn't backed up by the data that was surrounding the ongoing spread of COVID and the and the 
the amount of uh, amount of positivity that was in the community. So people wanted to get back, but it wasn't it really wasn't wise, I think, at that point to do it. Um, I think that the the goal is to go full hybrid. I, I think that people like to be able to to participate from home. They, they don't have to go to a full meeting. I think that should be our goal moving forward. Um, I don't think that if we had if we went back to meetings relatively soon, as in like right away, that um, we would be really be losing too much in terms of of participation if if we didn't have hybrid for a couple of a couple of months until the administration got their their project done. So I, I you know we still have the meetings would would be recorded and and available for view. Uh, it would really test, I think, uh, the assertion that I've been getting from people who have stopped me on the street or or, or uh, forcefully suggested to me uh, that we need to get back and that the only way that we should be meeting is in person. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to see how uh, our participation from the public goes up or down. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious how that works out. I'm glad to see that we've got 17 attendees on the on the on the uh, meeting right now. Hopefully we'll have 17 people showing up at every meeting, hopefully more. But I think that it's it's okay to say that it, it, at this point in the game, it's time to get back to, uh, to in person meetings, we get hybrid as soon as we can. Um, and we just get back to the, the normalcy that I think we all crave, even if that means that I have to leave my house. Thank you, uh, Council O'Neill. Yes, um, the, I've been hearing for quite some time that we need to get back to Kairos. I have a question though. Um, is there a reason why we can't go to Kairos with our laptops? No. Why? The Wi-Fi. Because they don't have the technology. There's not. There's not enough um, technology to be able to receive all of those. I think it goes back. Joanne, maybe you can describe what it's like on election day when you had so many different systems going and how it was just um, not able to handle the capacity of all the people dialing in. So that's the technology upgrade that we need in Kairos. Joanne, okay. can you elaborate on that? I remember that that was a huge issue. Um, yes, what happens is that we all can't be in the same room with our laptops without the hybrid equipment. Um, everybody, you're going to hear the echoing, you're going to hear the background, you're going to, and you, you're not going to be able to hear the person speak. So you need that equipment to, would you say distribute, I'm not a techie, but to distribute it to the different um, equipment that needs to be in order to collaborate with everybody. So for instance, if I was in a conference and my assistant wanted to come in my office to, to do the same, a Zoom or a Google chat, we wouldn't be able to do it because our computers, one echoes all the time. So she has to go to a different office in order to the, attend the same Zoom. Okay, wow. It's kind of like how, um, you know how when we go to the Harbor Master's office, um, the conference room, that it has to be all, the, the, we, we can't put our um, speakers on. We have to be able to have the, um, the main speaker that, that listens to us. And we have to all turn our speakers down, our voices down on our laptops. And if we have them on, all of a sudden it, it shocks us with, with echoing and, and sounding like it's a tunnel. So that's part of the technology that you need. And the size of that Kairos is so huge. And the walls are just so troubling because they're very thick and hard to get wiring around. So it's a bigger project than we would have hoped, but um, based on the, the folks that, that have been looking into it, I believe that, that, you know, that they understand what the path is that we have to take. So that's a great question because, um, but, but I, hopefully that, that answer helps you, Tracy. It does, thank you. Could um, 1623 stream it live and allow people to ask questions or no? No, 1623 can can um, stream it live, um, but, but that's part of the contract issue that we're dealing with right now because they haven't been there now for a couple of years and they have to get back and, and allow um, them to start taking over again with that. And, um, and so 
you know, that's a missing element because I would never want to even, cons- you know, I, I mean, I, I guess, right. well, I, I want to be the last person to deliberate. So I'm not going to speak right now until everyone's spoken. Um, Councilor yes. Gross. <clears throat> yeah, I, I find it interesting that I'll be next <clears throat> reading soon the 400th um, message that for other than the last three years, for 400 years, we've been meeting in person. And to have this debate about that we have to have, um, you know, absolutely cannot meet without the technology available to us, I find a little bit um, uh, troubling because we've been going for 397 years uh, Mm -hmm. doing it directly. And um, I think that the sooner we get back, the better. Um, I think the, the start time, which we will discuss, um, will need to be adjusted. And uh, it it will be, it you know, for all the reasons we can't do it with the laptops because you do it, you have a single um, camera uh, pointing to all of us and a single set of microphones that are that are picking it up that's all in one system and that's how that all works. And that's what we're waiting to have done. Um, you know, the, the administration, you know, has, it's, it's been approved that the contract is going out. Um, I don't think we can light the fire under contractors any faster than, 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 you know, we, we, we certainly can't, but I don't think the administration can either. They're, they're a victim of, you know, the today's, today's, um, you know, availability of technicians. So, um, I'm I'm all in favor for going back, uh, not being uh, a slave to the to the legislation, and also um, Councillor O'Neill pointed out something earlier that we need guidance from the uh, the state on. In particular, is mm-hmm. we can't we can't operate um, do our business if we have to shut down because we lose technology. Technology, to, as anybody knows, is finicky, mm-hmm. and we have to be able to operate um without being slaves to the technology also so we need some guidance on that i hope that if the state does extend this they give guidance on not just remote participation but also remote meetings and how that is going to be addressed in the open meeting law so that's that's something i think we need to ask for thank you anyone else like to speak on on this matter um Council Grow, you've already spoken, but I'll let you speak again I, as long I, as you please. Are you, are you suggesting that we're going to make a, a, a decision tonight on when we're going to go back? I, I, I'm not sure if, if we can, because I think that there are a couple of, of missing elements here that we need to um, to confirm. But I just wanted to get a hearty dialogue because I, I don't think we can keep kicking the can down the road here because we have to start making some decisions. Um, you know, so. So I will speak briefly. I'm passionate that we need to get back in person, passionate. I think it's so important. I think that's what I've heard from the community. And um, as you have said, I think COVID is behind us and um, we have to be leaders here. And and, and I'm so ready to get back. Um, At the same time, I do think that the people of Gloucester, really many, many new faces are zooming in and feeling really excited about it and um, enjoying it. And I think people enjoy watching the meetings the next morning and um, and participating in public hearings and public comments. I think there's so many good things. I've been passionate about this for two years that we needed to do true hybrid. And I love what we're doing right now at the Harbor Masters Room Conference Room. It's a great location and, it, and our meetings feel real and it feels so nice to have a mixture of people present and um, and then able to dial in if they want to watch it live. So I, I for all the great reasons, I, I, that's where I want to be. Um, so I think my action items. <clears throat> I've heard everybody's um, recommendations right now. Um, I need to get an update from Ryan on when the technical um, products are going to arrive because our CAO. Um, said that they have not yet arrived. And then from that, perhaps I can redefine, is it going to be on the eight weeks or is it going to be on the 12 weeks or 10? So so get a feel for 
what the project plan is. Is it 10, 8, 10, or 12 weeks? And then come back to you at the next meeting. And at that point, we will know what the um, governor has voted um, and what that specifically means to us. Do we need to do a hurry up or not? Um, and then the third matter is that we have to ask once again to understand the status of the MOU between the city and um, Studio 1623 coverage. Um, so, because I think, you know, Studio 1623, even if we are doing true hybrid, has an obligation to help do coverage for us as well on cable. And they've been doing that, but they've been really just plugging in our Zoom conversations. And it would be nice to understand how they can enhance that. Um, so people that maybe aren't with their laptops can also watch our meetings really accurately and clearly on, um, on cable as an option as well. Um, so um, Council Grow. I think Council Worthley had his hand up before me, but. Um, oh, okay. Um, Council Worthley. I respect that. I, he, Council Grow can go first unless you'd like me to. Go for it, please. So thank you. Um, so I think that all your considerations are important and I don't want to sound like I'm not hearing that, but what I heard from, I think Council Gross said it, Gross said we shouldn't be, I don't think you used the word slave, but dependent on the governor's office making a decision. We shouldn't be beholden to just technology. For 397 years, we've met in person successfully. Um, I just wonder why we could make a motion today and set a date, for example, April 11th, which would be our next, thank you, not the next meeting, but the meeting after that. And that would give us enough time to put notifications out for public hearings and do all that. And simultaneously, there's no reason why this track can't be moving forward on getting technology up and running as fast as we can with hybrid. So unless there's a reason I can't, I haven't heard that we can't make the motion, I'd like to make a motion. And, but I don't want to take away from what Council Grow was going to say. Well, if I can, because I... I'm okay. Go ahead, Council Grow. I, I, would, I was gonna, I was gonna say very much the same thing. We've got two, we've got a meeting on the 28th, I think, Two weeks is probably sufficient to get a, an update from the administration on the on the timeline of the hybrid uh, implementation, which I don't think at this point we should be hanging our hat on one way or the other. And it also gives us time to find out what the obligations of 1623 are. Maybe we put it up for a vote on the 28th to to go back on the 11th and uh, and that be the that be our that be our deadline that be our timeline and and the other timelines will have to will have to fit in with what we're doing. I mean, the administration is going to do what they they can do on the technical side of things. There's no hurrying that. But I don't think that at this point, um, I agree we shouldn't be necessarily worrying about what the state does in terms of of the, their their response or the administration's response on the technology. We should be making a decision for the council, and and that should be our priority. Um, so may I interject and then I'll go to Council Gross. Um, my interjection is based on Joanne and the amount of lead time that we need for advertised public hearings. Uh, uh, and I think April 11th will be too tight. I think we'd probably have to um, hope for April 25th, which would be on the eight week plan from, the, from IT's project plan and then throw that out because on uh, the 11th voting at the next meeting, it's public hearings are being um, okay, fair. advertised. So that would, that I would be my, one of my points, yes. Okay, and who else did I um, talk over? I'm sorry, I'm supposed to go last. Um, Council Memard. I just, it, it's an interesting exercise. As, as soon as we do get back to meeting in person at Kairos, if we're not simultaneously uh, participating with a lar larger audience via Zoom, we'll, we'll for sure be getting a lot of feedback about the, lo the <laughs> loss of Zoom. And I think that will be, to, to Jason's point, a good gauge of uh, to what extent we, we, you know, we inconvenience our constituencies by not offering the Zoom platform from the convenience of folks' homes. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Okay, is everyone comfortable with um, the, at the next meeting, officially vote on um, getting back in person 
at Kairos on April 25th and to um, continue to drive the need to get the technology up to date as fast as possible to get as close to that date as possible. And we would consider going to that date with the possibility of, this is not a, a formal vote. I'm just, brain, I'm just trying to summarize what I've heard. We could go back to that date with a possibility of not having a meeting or two with um, Zoom, um, provided that um, Studio 1623 will be able to provide live coverage on cable with the, the recordings available possibly on our website, which would be kind of extra. You know, I mean, we I have to see what the MOU does. This. So does that sound like a good plan right now, counselors? Yep. Is there okay. any reason why we couldn't vote on it now for the 25th? Um, I feel kind of a need to circle back with, with Ryan and with uh, Senator Tarr's office and, um, you know, the missing element of this week's um, governor's orders because those variables should be looked at and also the Studio 1623 um, requirement, which I think we they've got to up their assistance to us if we were to go back on the 25th um, without Zoom to do a really good job because I don't want the residents of Gloucester to miss anything um, except for maybe Zoom for um, a meeting or two provided we can't get the technical products in. Um, Tony? Council Grove, that, sorry. Won't that, that's all right. Won't that push out again the public hearing process that we would then have to go to the first meeting in May if we wait till the next meeting? I mean, um, I'm not sure. I know Senator Tyre's office is not, you know, it's pretty assured that that's going to pass and get signed by the governor. So, you know, we can count on that being, you know, 90, 95% um, sure. And, the rest is, you know, information that we kind of have already. Um, so I'm just worried about pushing the public hearings out, um, you know, that we're going to have to then postpone it for another two weeks into May. Um, Joanne, do you want to comment on that? Because this is your baby. Yeah. Uh, this, this is my concern. Okay. Um, if we had an answer this week or the following week, it'd be great about remote participation but we don't have it from the legislature. My problem is getting, we proposed two public hearings to take place April 11th, uh, which we stated before. One was the short-term rentals, okay? And the other one was um, the proposal whether the city council would opt out of vote by mail. But we could do that further along um, as long as we do it 45 days before the election. The concern is getting the um, legal notice in the paper in time, okay? In order to do an ordinance, we need at least to advertise seven days in advance. Um, also, I'm not sure of the other um, special city council that we have before us. Um, I believe we have to advertise before a certain date. So, and we would have to advertise that two weeks in advance and anything that would be voting on for ordinance changes at ONA that would pile up the public hearings if we delayed it. I'm not saying you should vote tonight, but what I'm saying, there is so many moving parts right now. I I'm not sure which way the council would want to go um, because of the legal notice has to be very specific, whether we're doing in person or whether it's going to be by remote participation. Council Grow. A uh, question uh, for Joanne. Could we not open the public hearings and continue them to a date certain two weeks hence and then re, re uh, name a new location for that public hearing? I mean, the, the whole point is you, you notice them for a specific thing. So we have to open them in a Zoom meeting on the 11th. Could we not then say this meeting is going to be continued until, well, I guess there's really no reason to do that. No, there? no, you, you can't because uh, your public hearing has to be a specific date and time and location. Okay. Okay. So the law so says. That's why, right. So that's why the start time is important for us um, because that has to be posted as well on yeah. our advertisements. So the legal notice has to do the start time the location, 
in the date. And Zoom technology, if it's being offered as yes. an option, in true yeah. hybrid. Yeah. yeah. Not um, having to be advertised. So we really don't have time to do anything with the public hearings on the 11th. There's nothing on the 28th that would be impacted because we're going to meet by Zoom on the 28th. Yes, that's true. But, but the, and the advertisements for the public hearings to the 11th have already been made? Yes. They're, they have, not for the 11th, no, I'm sorry. For the 28th, they have. The 11th, they have not. We still have time. But like I said, my the proposal that is before the city council for the vote by mail, that could be pushed out to the 28th of April. Um, we had mentioned about the short-term rentals being April 11th. Um, it, it all depends on the urgency of that um, ordinance. That could be also be pushed out for to April 28th. Those are the only two matters right now um, that was voted on at um, ONA to go forward for April 11th. And then anything that comes up between uh, at ONA Monday night, any other code of ordinance changes um, you can probably push that out to April 28th if there's not an urgency to get a, an ordinance, um, you know, going. Um, let's see if somebody can have a wrap up conversation. Um, Council O'Neill, you haven't spoke recently, and then I'll go back up to Council Gross and to Council Worthley. Go ahead, Council O'Neill. Doesn't a lot of this depend on 1623 Studios as well? Because if they're not available, right? Yeah, the, I mean, we need to we need to secure that, and um, they have a meeting schedule with administration at the end of this month. Okay. Um, Council Gross, and then Council Worthley. Yeah, um, as the sponsor of the short term rental, I have, uh, there is no urgency um, that can get pushed out. I'm just the only concern I have is that it butts up against. The more we stack public hearings, the more we're going to go into extension of our meetings. That's my only concern. But Tracy brings up a good point about 1623. Um, otherwise, because <clears throat> that's been a stalwart for 25 mm -hmm. years or longer. Mm -hmm. um, so to lose that for the public would be, you know, quite a disservice. Yeah. So possibly, and we're also missing two members, although, you know, we have a quorum. So that's how how we work. But yeah. You know, it, it, delaying for two weeks is not the end of the world for anything. And go ahead, Council Worthley. Yeah, I think there's a lot of considerations that we need to weigh here, and we're doing that. The one, though, that I think Council Grow or Gross raised it, if we wait two weeks, then we compound a problem. I think when in doubt, leaders lead, and that's what we are. And if it means that we have to work harder or faster or more, that's what we do. And I don't want to be putting pressure on the administration to pull things together erroneously, but if it means we get it done a little faster, great. And if they can't get it faster, then that's the consequence of taking, making a decision. So I like to make a motion. Um, and, I, and this is with respect, Councillor Gilman, I know there's a lot that needs to happen in between now and the 25th of April, but I make a motion that the Gloucester City Council return to in-person meetings at Kairos Auditorium beginning April 25th with the hope of having hybrid technology added as soon as possible and ask the administration to do everything they can to expedite that. And I so move. Second. Okay, a motion has been made by Council Worthley is seconded by Council Gross. Is there a discussion, Councillors? Um, on your motion, Council Worthley. Just a point of information. Do we need a majority vote of the seven or majority of the council for something like this? Okay. Um, I don't love us making a vote of this significance without the vice chair. Um, I agree. Honestly. Um, and, um, and I don't and, want to um, speak on his behalf, but he did say yesterday to me that he wants to go back in person as fast as possible. I don't order. want to. Point of order. Um, Council Grope, um, what is your point? Your comfort or discomfort with the numbers isn't really relevant. It's The question is do we do it in a majority of the, of the, of the councillors that are there? Or a majority of the whole council. I think that answer that question, then we can move on. We've got we've got a majority and of the full council, but do we need five votes of seven, or do we need well, we need five Four. votes? It doesn't matter. 
Yeah, so it's five votes is five votes. No, it's so, either four oh, votes five, or seven. Oh, no, or sorry, right. it's either four for, or five. For I, think it's, I think it's always of the council. For discussion purposes, I, I'm happy to support having the council set a uh, restart date in Kairos for the 25th of April, as has been proposed and seconded. But the time will, but the time will still need to be figured out by O and A. We should have it done in Sorry, six months, correct? Yeah. So, I mean, so my order on the end time, not the end of times, but the end time of our meeting, um, would run separately. I think for advertising purposes, we probably have to say not just April twenty fifth, but a time certain. So I would entertain a friendly amendment to make that be 6 p.m. on April 25th. We can address the end time at a future ref a future point. Yep. And, and so, I would I would share with you, having spoken to Council Nolan, because he has a late night at work, um, he, is, he has assured me that he would be okay with 6 p.m. Um, he thinks that he can make that. And, and um, when people get up at four in the morning to work, um, 6 p.m. is a little bit nicer to start um, than 7, particularly if we're going to make a four-hour time frame. So, um, like, we have someone waking up right now. Is that, Council Mishota, is that your, um, your wake-up what do you call? <laughs> I have no idea what that was, but um, okay. I still feel like ONA should be able to vote on star time. I do have my opinion on that, but I'm due waiting for my other ONA members <laughs> on star time. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm at the Council's beck and call. Yeah, I, I think I think we can separate the, the start time from our orders, honestly. Um, you know, so I don't I don't have a problem with that. Um, I think I think to Jeff's point, he was talking about a closure time, but it's kind of linked to a start time. So I think I think I, I'm comfortable if we just if you want to vote that we want 6 p.m. to be our start time, official start time, no matter what we do whether it be live at Kairos or, um, you know, um, without Zoom, with Zoom, full hybrid, 6, 6 p.m. So um, I don't want to promote, but we have a motion on the floor right now. So, um, so, right, so we have, I put an amendment on the floor, which is to add uh, 6 p.m. If ONA decides to discuss it and come back with something else, we'd be open to that. But I think for the purpose of this vote, we need to have a start time for public hearing notification. So that's why I added 6 p.m. I don't know if there's any objection or do we, does that need to be voted on separately? I just call it a friendly so the, amendment. So the amendment, the amendment to, I think it was Council Memards. No, who made the motion? Was it Council Gross? Okay. No, I made the um, So Council Worthy made an amendment to his um, motion um, for 6 p.m. start time. So is there a second to that second. amendment? Um, seconded by Council Memard. Um, are you through speaking on the amendment, Council Worthley, so I can speak, I can call on Council right, Gross? This, this is just to have a date certain. ONA can certainly review yeah. the entirety of it at some point. Yes. Right, um, exactly. Okay, Council Gross. Uh, do we do we need to have something in this motion or an amendment to this motion to have some kind of recording available um, if sixteen twenty three situation cannot be sorted out that we have some form of of uh, recording this recording our meeting? Um, Joanne, um, what what is your status of recorders? Um, because I know that we have used them before. Um, no, I'm I'm talking. About Oh, you Are you talking about televising? Yes, I'm talking about a video okay. recording of it. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't I have. have that, the, yeah, I don't have the ability to video no, record. That's a, that's a question for Ryan. Yeah. If 1623 is not available, do we need to um, have that available? I think it's just a discussion that needs to be had here um, during this motion. Um. Council Majota. I'm all for in person. I just think by what we're doing discussing is that we're asking a lot more questions that we don't have answers to. And to have a hard close or something, 
we've been doing the Zoom for 15 months, or you in the previous council has done it longer. It is currently working. I think that we just need more information, more facts, and to rush a close if we're not sure if we're able to show the public, if we're not able to, if it's, it's gotta be able to work, I don't see the need to rush and whether we start May 1st or May 31st or whatever, it's just, it's going to be the same. So I'd rather just, I'm not, I support the meeting in person. I love to be there, but I think we just have more questions than answers and we're just we're trying to rush. That's, that's it. So I'm not supporting the amendment. Okay. Um, so um, anyone else like to speak on the amendment? Um, Council Grow. Um, yeah, I, I think Frank brings up a fair point. I'm, I'm totally in, in support of the idea of going back sooner than later. But, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, if, if the issue is having a couple more weeks to have some questions answered, um, I don't, I don't see that we, we really, we're not, we're not going to harm anything by by waiting two weeks and maybe having this discussion on the 28th again. I, I, you know, as I support Jeff, your 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 motion in in concept and all. I just think that obviously mm -hmm. there's a lot of lot of what ifs and what what can we do is that we're not quite sure yet. And to put a fine point on it, we 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 would be better off making this decision uh, armed with a little bit more uh, information. I think. I'm, so if I'm we could get Ryan, week. if we could get Ryan Knowles to come to our next meeting with um, the answers that we've asked. Yeah. But I think um, Councilor Worthy, would you be comfortable um, withdrawing without prejudice your um, your motion? It's a fair question. I, I my debate I'm having is if we wait two weeks, then we run into the same problem with when we advertise hearings and then we have to postpone it further. I think we'll get the answers very quickly. The reason why I added the 6 p.m. is because we need a date, a time certain to, to mm -hmm. advertise the meetings. But I don't know that if the goal was to say we want to go back in person, regardless of whether hybrid is ready, but push to get it done as fast as we can. We want to go back in person, regardless of what the governor decides. I don't know that in two weeks, Ryan telling us that it could be done in a month or not changes the desire for us to be back in person. So for me, I think it's a goal setting. April 25th is gives us six weeks to pull this together. And if we got to get a volunteer camera person like we used to do years ago, we do that. And um, I'm not trying to put pressure that's not hand, that people can't handle. This is, can we go back to in person on April 25th? So waiting two more weeks creates other consequences. So council grow, you're right. There's other variables, but then that creates more variables on advertising for hearings. So um, I, I think we should put it to a vote. That's my um, hope. I just, so, okay. The, the um, first, I'm so. I, I need an amendment to my own amendment on the 6 p.m. I think that can be accepted as a friendly amendment to my own thing. So that was just to put a date time on it, date and time start. So I don't know where we go from here. Do you, want, do you want to withdraw the amendment to your motion so we can vote separately on the start time? Can I, can I no. um, speak before he does that? You don't have to do that. Council O'Neill, you have the floor. Thank you. I think I'm, I'm a person who needs a deadline. And if we have a deadline, we'll do it. That's the way it is. It's the way it's always been. And if you have a deadline, it will happen. If you don't have a deadline, well, two weeks, and this one and that, it's just people are chomping at the bit for in-person meetings. They are <coughs> chomping at the bit. And they don't understand the um, the hesitation that the council has. Not that it's hesitation, but why are we dragging our feet and there's no reason for it? COVID's over. I, I'm getting all of it. People want in-person meetings. And if we make a deadline, we will make it happen, whether it's 1623 or whether it's, I don't know, some station from Beverly, uh, it will happen. So so I, I do want to weigh in here, okay, because I, um, Council Worthley was at the Gainesville Community Center and we had a top-notch videographer doing the session there. Um, 
all kinds of fancy equipment and um, the acoustics were not good. And, um, and so it, it, it's, it's that, that room is so huge to get good clarity on a, some type of videographer that we get that doesn't have all the technical knowledge and capacities, capabilities of what we used to have there, um, which probably needs to be modified now. I think that I'm a little bit concerned that we're not, we're, we're simplifying how this videography is going to be and we need to put it on cable. So if we don't have the relation, if we don't have the deal made with Studio 1623, we're not going, where are we gonna put this? It's gonna be an unclear, not easy to hear video on our website under YouTube. I mean, it's just not that easy. So um, I don't mind saying we'd like it to be our goal of April 25th provided um, we can work out all these logistics. I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I think it's, that would okay. be my recommendation. Is that an amendment to what I've had? The sure, motion on I'll the table? throw that out. Okay. That, that we'd like to have, you know, provided these other questions can be um, answered. Seconded. Okay. Tony, you, you look like you're meeting. frustrated. Do you want to, um, do you want to be the first to um, discuss this? <clears throat> oh, we're just still putting a lot of pressure on poor Joanne and her staff to be able to deal with this. We either make it the 25th, video or no, um, recording or no. That's it. Bottom line, it's, you know, you can't just bring in Beverly. You can't just bring in somebody, a volunteer. To re there's all kinds of equipment you have to have. Microphones, you have mm -hmm. to have, you know, there's all kinds of equipment that, that, involves you know studio 63 uh 1623 was fully set up in kairos to record those meetings they had their whole sound system set up they were completely wired and and tapped right in and so it um it, it we either say we're doing whatever the date was that jeff picked what was it april 25th, april 25th. Mm -hmm. and you know Damn the torpedoes full speed ahead as whatever that admiral's name was, whether we have video or not, because we have to allow our staff and the clerk's office to have clarity. We can't have this opaque vote. We either voted up with knowing, with full knowledge that we may not have the capacity. Now, Ryan may be able to wire in something to have a small camera there that gets a, a broad picture of us. But other than that, um, you know, we're, if or 1623, but other than that, there really aren't any options other than we're back fully in person, you know, without with technical difficulties. Okay, we need to we need to wrap up. Um, Council Worthy, you have the floor. Thanks. I'll be brief on this. So when I said volunteer, I didn't just mean anybody. I know that in the past, um, Cable Vision, Adelphia, 1623, they have trained people go through a course and I remember Greg Smith used to do this. And there's another young woman and they would do it on a volunteer basis. They'd be signed up and trained. And so I didn't mean just any random person, but I do respect the point. And I think Councilor Gross was, is yours that raised the question of should we incorporate videography into the motion? But I think what you're saying is we should vote yes or no on do we go back in person and we can all have a goal or hope a desire to have it filmed with hybrid and we just all work towards that in whatever capacities that we can, but to tie the vote to that capacity does hinder the clerk's office from um, advertising meetings. So I don't know where we stand as a motion. I know my motion is on the table for April 25th at 6 p.m. And I know Councillor Gilman added in the provider we could have the video, but I think maybe provided is the wrong word, just with a goal or hope of having video. I'm not sure where we go, how you wanna handle it from here. I would never want to have an in-person meeting for us without a clear video of our meeting. I think I think that that would be totally appalling to the citizens of Gloucester who really want to watch us and to and to listen to us. Um, 
I don't know why sometimes, but somehow they do. <laughs> um, so, so that is that I, I'm passionate about that. If we're going to go forward without Zoom, um, so um, so let's let let's let's leave it at this, okay? I mean, the motion is the 25th. Um, we've got some provided. These technical questions can be resolved. And if we can get them communicated to us before the next meeting, as long as we leave that communications in as a document in our council packet for our next meeting on the 28th, then we'll communicate to the public what this information is, right? And we can remove it off the consent agenda and tell everybody what has happened. So we can, we can keep moving along without having to wait, at least on coming up with the answers to these questions of, of great need. Does that sound okay? Um, yeah. So I think we're ready to vote then on Council Worthley's um, um, motion. Um, Council <laughs> Grove, once again. I just, I just want a reiteration of what we're voting on. So we're voting on returning to live meetings April 25th at 6 p.m. subject to the information being received by the council from the administration on the timeline for hybrid development and 1623 recording capabilities by next week, by the next meeting. Is that- That sounds pretty good. That, do, is that what we understand it to be? Because I that's what I, I, I'm willing to- Council Worthy, are you, are you comfortable with that interpretation? So, yes. so that sounds great. All right, I think we're ready to vote because if not, we're all gonna- <laughs> um, Okay, so um, roll call vote. Wait, did we determine if it's four um, votes or five votes? I think I, I would like it to be five votes. Five. Um, because five I think we. Council. Yeah. All right. Um, so I am just going to. Um, who would like to call the roll? <laughs> Tony. I'll do it. Hold on. Okay, here we go. Um, Council Gross. Uh, no, because I just think it's way too uh, foggy. Okay, Council Grow. Well, if it's foggy for Tony, it's going to be foggy for me. So I'll say no as well. Council Majota? I agree with Tony. the other councilors. No, still too much. Memard? You're Council on mute. Memard. At this point, because of these uncertainties, I'd rather rely on what we're doing right here, right now for the time being. So no. Council Nolan is absent. Council O'Hare is absent. Council O'Neill. Uh, I'm going to say no because it's, there's not enough votes anyway. So, <laughs> Council Worthley. I'm voting yes for my motion. Yes. And Council Gilman, no, just because I I, I have a need to get um, these answers. Um, but I but I think we're we're passionate and we have a good message to bring forward and. I promise you that I will work really hard to get all these details as soon as possible so we can move forward. Okay. So um, yeah. does this impact ahead. the clerk's okay. office? Does this impact the clerk's office on not being advertised for the meetings? And or does Council Grow or Gross have a motion that has less ambiguity to it that we could vote on? No. We we'll move forward. Okay. No, I just it's just too many. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I okay. Um, I, I, I thank you, counselors. I mean, thank this you. is this is what we have to do. We sometimes we have to have these tough discussions. So thank you. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. Um, Council President, can you just um, read what the vote was for the record? Because we know it. Oh, today. I'm sorry. I uh, didn't. I didn't. Um, I did not do that. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, one in favor, six opposed, two absent. Okay, thank you. Thank you for reminding me to do that. Um, so next, final order of business, or kind of the final order, no, second to final, um, Madam Clerk. Okay, it's um, Councilor Gross, the City Council statement regarding the Gloucester 400 celebration, and I will share my screen with the logo. Great, and I'm gonna ask Council Gross to um, be the first one that's gonna officially make this announcement. And um, and also just note that uh, Ruth Pino, who is one of our tri-chairs 
for the 400th is on the call. And um, so Council Gross, if you wouldn't mind reading um, our statement and support for the 400th. Okay. 2023 marks the 400 years since the English Dorchester Company landed on our shores. Gloucester sits on the ancestral homeland of the Pontucket people and their neighbors, the Massachusetts Nipmuc, the Penacook, and the Wampanoag tribes. Please enjoy the year-long and multiple events throughout 2023, most of which will be free or at low cost. Visit Gloucester, MA400, all one word, dot org, for a list of upcoming upcoming events, like and share the Gloucester 400 Facebook page. To receive major event notifications by email, send requests to info at gloucesterma400.org. And that concludes that. But we also, I just went to the website. There is at least three to five events every week this month. So um, a lot is going on. Thank you so much, Council oh, and Gross. Also, also tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but the 17th is the deadline for all of you who want to get in on the 400 story projects to get your stories in. So you want to get your story in, the deadline is the 17th, St. Patty's Day. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. You did an awesome job. And um, counselors, Every meeting we're going to rotate. Um, so the person first on the um, on the roll call will be able to uh, make that announcement. So thank you. Um, final order of business, Madam Clerk. Also is request to the mayor. <clears throat> okay, by roll call, Councilor Gross. I don't have any requests, but I did get an interesting call was left on my machine today when I got home um, from a, one of our senior citizens who was accosting um, the person who called them, who they thought was me because my uh, my phone number had been spoofed. And they had gotten a call that said that their grandchild has an emergency and needs money. You need to send it back. She was wonderful. She was berating the heck out of me. And it was perfect. <laughs> um, I called her up. You know, I call her ID. I called her back and, and thanked her for leaving the message. But it wasn't me who who was who was trying to scam her. But our senior citizens need to be aware yes. and vigilant um, on this, but she did a wonderful job and handled it perfectly. Um, it was, it was great to hear that, um, hear her. Uh, I saved the recording so I could cherish it. It was, it was a, her, the, her response was perfect. And I told her that we had a wonderful conversation. So I just wanted to share that. That's nice. And I know the police will, um, will do some updates when that's happening. So maybe you could be in touch with um, Chief Conley. Yeah, they may be grabbing all of it. We may all get those messages. They may be grabbing city councilors' phone numbers. Yeah, well, I'm a senior citizen, so it was on my I home mean... phone. It was my home phone number, so the, <laughs> the landline. Thank you. Um, next is um, Council Grow. I'm good to go. Council Majota. I'm good. Uh, Council Memard. I have several requests that I'll be sharing with the mayor's office in person uh, separately, but. Again, I did, I, I did forward to all counselors and the mayor's office the uh, written update of our Ward 1 uh, community meeting at the East Gloucester School on May 2nd, or March 2nd. Uh, we had 30, 30 people turned out. Uh, the two biggest concerns, local concerns, were uh, needing to create a, a, a participatory process around developing the East Gloucester School site. and. Uh, we feel like the administration's not taking the leadership on that, that we need to uh, form our own citizen task group um, to uh, organize ourselves and be clear about what the limits are and what the opportunities are and what the funding is under the chapter 97, article 97 use for the uh, recreational open space for the school site. Uh, and we will be obviously dovetailing with the administration, but people felt frustrated enough that they wanted to form a task group to try and clarify that. Secondly, uh, also, uh, extreme high frustration regarding uh, the lack of action on the creek pollution and the going on second or third year 
broad impacts financially, health-wise, liability, loss of employment. They're concerned about health issues. They're documenting problems that some of the uh, surfers are encountering. Uh, and as, as I've written, they, there is a, now a Clean the Creek task force um, headed by a local resident, a, a gal named Rory McCarthy. Uh, they're meeting Thursday night again uh, at the uh, what is Surf Safari on Bass Avenue and by Zoom. Uh, if you go to their, their website, Clean the Creek, clean the creek you can find the contact information or just show up. But um, we have a, a meeting scheduled with some interested parties next week with the administration. Uh, but there's a real sense that this is going to come around and bite us if we don't do a better job of uh, resolving it after all this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor O'Neill. Thank you. I don't know if this is um, appropriate or if it's possible, maybe I should say. Um, I'm looking at item number four, uh, memorandum from CFO transfer of capital project funds to the general fund. And with the $145,000, $145,743.86, most of it was put into the general fund because it was miscalculated. I'm wondering if some of that money can be used to repair or replace the sidewalk on Mason Street. Um, Senior citizens from Central Grandma walk that sidewalk. They're walking in the middle of the street and the sidewalk's so broken. So that would be my request. Can he use some of those funds to repair the, the or re, uh, replace the sidewalk on Mason Street? Thank you, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Worthley. Yes, I have a number of them. I'm going to run through them. First, I want to say I think this is a very good meeting. Good dialogue, good discussion, and um, I look forward to the next ones. Um, some of these are for the administration and some of them are just general things. Firstly, the most important thing I did in the last weekend and the weekend before that was attend my daughter's um, O'Malley, well, O'Malley School Academy um, musical Beauty and the Beast Junior, and it was a fantastic job. For everybody, the kids worked so well together, and the, the technology, and just the teachers, uh, everyone just came together. It's just six performances in the last ten days. It's um, it really is something to be commended. Uh, I also want to give credit to the mayor. Um, we had the the meeting where he had mentioned that they weren't going to be the bathrooms that we expected or had hoped for at the softball field. I put a motion an order in to have budget and finance look at it and talk about it with him. And he ended that meeting with, but don't give up hope. And then on 1623 Studios last week, I saw that he found a solution for permanent uh, bathrooms tying into the sewer on Green Street. So good work. Um, I'm not sure where it stands, but just, you know, might as well um, give credit where credit's due. Um, I want to echo Council Memhar's comments on the creek. I was at his ward meeting, happy to listen to people there as well. And, you know, the Board of Health, well, the health department received a letter, uh, the report on November 2nd. We received it in late February. Um, and I've been asking for a while to, can there be a presentation on it? And what I get back is read the report. And like Council Memhart said, um, there's a lot of lingo and engineering stuff that I don't understand completely. I can't expect the public to understand. Can we have a presentation on where things stand? Because before we know it, summer will be here and um, warmer weather, hopefully, but people will need to know what's happening there. Um, and similarly, um, I got a text message from a constituent last week saying uh, she'd heard about the situation with the, the wastewater treatment plant. And I said, I hadn't heard yet. And then she drew my attention to a lawsuit she saw in, in, in Boston papers, or she called it a lawsuit. I connected with the newspaper, Gloucester Times, and then they did a story on the consent decree, which was signed and dated on December 2nd. And from a sense of communication, I would like to think that the council would have got that sooner than March. And I think we should do a presentation on what that really looks like. Um, the mayor's been talking about it, and I appreciate that he's been raising awareness on this, but talking about a $100 million project, now it's a $150 million project. 
it may be more, there's impact to our sewer rates, which we would have to vote on and be prepared for. And I think that's valuable to, to have that. Um, segwaying right into water, the water bills didn't go out. I think they go out March 1st and do an April 1st. If they haven't gone out, does that mean people are still obligated to pay them by April 1st? Or does that give an extension? Um, again, I don't have a solution to that because I just learned this today. So um, that's important. And then um, lastly, we all received an email regard regarding um, a retaining wall on River Road. And I just wonder if we could have an engineer or DW look at it and potentially put horses up in the meantime to protect any further weight being put on that road, that um, that roll, that road, and that wall. So, uh, put that request in. That's it. Sorry for the long list. Thank you. And me, um, I'm going to move to um, adjourn. Is there second. is there a second? Second. Um, roll call vote for the last time. Uh, Council Gross. Yes. Council Grow. Yep. Council Majota. Yes. Council Memard. Yes, good night. Council O'Neill. Yes. Council Worthley. Yes. Council Gilman. Yes. Good night, everybody. Joanne, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Right. Thank, thank you, Joanne. Yeah. Thank you. Good night.